and welcome to tonight's webinar. We thank you for joining us. These are quarterly webinars brought to you by the Institute for Dental Specialists, and this is open for all specialists um, and all general dentists who are working with specialists. So we're happy to have you, and uh, our next uh, session will be in December, and you'll if you're on our mailing list, uh, we'll give you notification of that. If you're not on our mailing list, you happen, happen to have been invited, then to get on our mailing list, just write to lee at directorofdentistry.com, and I'll be happy to put you on the mailing list, and you'll be notified of all of these, all of these seminars. A few months ago, I was uh, at a meeting, and I saw somebody who I had never met before. His name was Dr. Richard Meyer, and he gave a one-hour program. Um, similar to what we're talking about tonight, but I think Rick is going to be doing uh, more for us than he was able to do, than he had time to do um, when uh, I saw him in Orlando. Uh, Dr. Richard Myron is currently lead educator and researcher at Advanced PRF, PRF Education and an adjunct visiting faculty in the Department of Periodontology in Bern, Switzerland, where he completed his PhD studies uh, since 2009. He has currently published over 150 peer-reviewed articles and lectures internationally on many topics relating to growth factors, bone biomaterials, and guided bone regeneration. Uh, he has recently been awarded many international prizes in dentistry and is widely considered as one of the top contributors to implant dentistry, having won the ITI Andre Shorter Prize, the IADR Young Investigator of the Year in the field of implant dentistry, and the American Academy of Implant Dentistry Young Investigator Grant Award. He has written two best-selling textbooks, widely distributed in regenerative dentistry, including his most recent uh, book, and that's in 2019, titled Next, Regeneration, Next Generation Biomaterials for Bone and Periodontal Regeneration. And a, two, and a second uh, book uh, in 2017, 2017 that's titled Platelet-Rich Fibrin in Regenerative Dentistry from Biological Background to Clinical Indications. You're in for a big treat. And I introduce you, Dr. Richard Mara. Rick, thanks for joining us tonight. Perfect. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. And it was a lot of fun to meet you down at the Florida Association of Perio. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to give the lecture as well. And uh, I specifically designed it to give kind of uh, exciting new biomaterials to those that are listening. Uh, and, and I'll go over kind of what I do um, and kind of my background and then how we get involved in some of these biomaterial research. And I've specifically focused that everything was really related to clinics. So it's really something that, you know, within the next few months or already currently, you can really adapt in your practice as of, you know, tomorrow if you'd like. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. That's great. And while you're doing that, if you have questions, uh, just click the Q&A box. You'll see a Q&A box either at the top of your screen or for most of you at the bottom of the screen. You can just uh, click that Q&A box, type in your question. I will ask the question, likely I'll ask most of the questions at the end of the presentation, but who knows? Rick is going to click on the q and I'll click on the Q&A, and uh, if we happen to see a question that, that, uh, that uh, would, uh, would, would help us with the presentation, we may just do uh, the question right then and there. So just use that Q&A box uh, liberally, and Rick, go right ahead. Perfect. Uh, so for those that don't know my background, uh, I'm trained uh, in dentistry as well as PhD in molecular and cell biology. So I have kind of a different background than most people. Um, I actually did PhD in molecular and cell biology in Switzerland. Uh, reason why I went to Switzerland was uh, as a Canadian, I'd won a big scholarship to be able to go and train anywhere in the world. It was fully funded. And I decided to go to Bern, Switzerland. And for those that don't know Bern, it's a very big headquarters for research. And we do a lot uh, with respect to biomaterial research and implant dentistry there. Uh, I got to live there for seven years. This is the dental school in Bern. Uh, my two supervisors in 2009 for my PhD were Anton Skoulian and also Danny Boozer. Um, for those that don't know them, they're quite well known internationally. Uh, Tony uh, Skoulian is very well known for periodontal regeneration. He's got a really great textbook on that topic. He also did most of the pioneering work in the 97, 98, 99 on endogain. So for those that are familiar with endogain for periodontal regeneration, he did a lot of the first clinical studies on the topic. Um, Dr. Boozer's done a lot with GBR, uh, done a lot with implant dentistry, rough and implant surfaces, contour augmentation. So he's quite well known as well in the implant dentistry field. And so uh, for me as a biologists, I got to work with these two colleagues. And one of the cool things was that a lot of companies wanted to test new biomaterials. 
uh, test new implant surfaces, and I was kind of the guy that was uh, doing this work. Always remember that um, biomaterials, before they're out to market to you guys, they come to preclinical labs typically two, three years ahead of time. Uh, we test them, you know, we do animal studies, uh, and then we do the first clinical studies before they get to you guys uh, out in the market. And so what's cool about my job is that I really get to see kind of, you know, what biomaterials are coming in 2000. 22, 2023, and work very closely with a lot of the companies that we do research with. Um, I relocated in 2016 to Florida, so I'm currently located in, in Florida. Uh, I spent some time at Nova Southeastern University developing a lot of uh, new research projects here and doing a lot of work with the FDA to get some of the new biomaterials approved for FDA. Um, it's here where I did a lot of research on PureF and developed a lot of new protocols related to that topic, and I'll talk more about that uh, throughout the lecture. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's very important to understand that, you know, discovery of new biomaterials, implant surfaces, etc., typically happens three to six years ahead of time before they go to you guys here. Perfect example of this is actually platelet-rich fibrin uh, was invented in 2001, 2002, was FDA approved around the year 2009. And uh, still to this day, there's many, many clinicians who have either A, not heard about it, or just getting trained on it within the last few months or last year or so. So uh, it takes a long time to translate all this new data uh, out to people. For those that are interested, uh, probably this book is uh, one of the most widespread for the topic of platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, I wrote it with uh, Joseph Chaprun, who's well known in the PRF field as well. And it goes over kind of all the clinical indications. So for those that don't know too much about PRF, this is a great resource, quite cheap textbook. And uh, one chapter is dedicated to extraction sockets, sinus grafting, uh, periodontal regeneration, gingival recessions, uh, implant dentistry. So every single clinical indication has a full chapter and how to use it in, in each of those indications. Um, what Personally, what I'm more known for is this textbook here. Uh, it's on biomaterials and I wrote it with Yu Feng Zhang, who's a Chinese colleague and he and I both lived in, in Bern, Switzerland while we're doing all this biomaterial research. And it basically tries to fill the gap between kind of what we know today, so what's leading edge, and then the gap in knowledge between what's leading edge and, and what clinicians currently know. And I think it's one of the reasons why it was quite well received by, by colleagues. Um, I always say a lot of colleagues get all of their info on biomaterials from sales reps, and it's one of the worst places in the world to, to learn about biomaterials because, you know, they're obviously uh, trying to sell stuff. And uh, the textbook kind of outlines, you know, when to use different biomaterials and kind of what's new. Uh, and very pleased to find out earlier this year, it was actually ranked number one most sold textbook. Uh, and this is the Quintessence website in the world actually. So um, for those that have any questions related to it, I'm more than happy to, to cover it. Um, so I wanna talk about new biomaterials and this one here is an exciting one. So I'm only gonna kind of, you know, fire some new materials for you guys, kind of what's coming out in the near future. This is one that I'm doing a lot of work in Florida with Dr. Mike Picos, who's a very close colleague of mine, oral maxillofacial surgeon. And what it is, is it's a bone adhesive. Okay, so this is one, chapter nine in our textbook. Um, and I just wanna show you guys the way that it's used and, and kind of the exciting uh, future that this biomaterial certainly will have. So essentially, a group of researchers based out of Boston were interested to figure out why it is that certain underwater aquatic worms can actually stick to bridges or st stick to coral reefs underwater for long term. And when they figured that out, they isolated the proteins and then they incorporate the proteins into a bone grafting material. Okay. So this is uh, similar to how it's going to be used. So for instance, uh, extraction socket, you want to place an, an implant immediately. Okay, material is going to go in the extraction socket, implant is going to go in, okay, and of course it has uh, adhesive properties. Now, it might not seem so impressive right now, but let me show you this video, okay. This is the material, this is a femur, okay, that's been cut in half, and I just want to show you the strength of the material, okay. This is directly thereafter. Uh, this is literally 10 minutes afterwards. This is how much strength it has. Okay, so I know personally, uh, Dr. Dr. Michael Picos down in uh, near Tampa, Florida has been using this in clinical practice now. He's doing the first uh, ever clinical study on this topic. It's a bone adhesive, okay, it glues literally bone to bone, 
and uh, bone to implants. So it's a fantastic biomaterial, a lot of future applications for it. And again, with respect to primary implant stability, this is a big one that I think will change many practices for those that are placing implants. Again, the name of the product is called Tetranite, and it's a company that's based out of Boston called Launchpad Medical. Um, we've done a lot of work in animal models, so this is throughout the textbook as well. Uh, just looking at these implants that are placed without primary stability. So when we do these actual studies, what we do down here is we place a uh, 2.8 millimeter implant into bone, so native bone, everything goes well. And we purposely create these oversized osteotomies. So here we have 4.3 millimeters, and then we place these 2.8 millimeter implants in there. And as you can imagine, the 2.8 millimeter implant is floating around in a 4.3 millimeter osteotomy. This thing fails right away. Um, at the same time, we use the same osteotomy, 4.3 millimeters, and we just add the tetranite, which is TN here for tetranite. And what we've noticed is that over time, from zero weeks all the way up to 30, 30 plus weeks, uh, ISQ values stay high, okay? Biomaterials perfectly integrated into bone, I'll show you some histology, and gets replaced over time. So here is some of the histology from this dog study. You can see here's the implant surface, here's the layer of, uh, Tetranite, here's bone. Uh, within four weeks, bone grows right up against the tetranite. So perfect uh, integration here. And over time, material is getting resorbed. So this is after 30 weeks, it's getting resorbed, replaced. Uh, tetranite is gone, and then you have bone implant contact. Okay? By one year, so after 52 weeks, material is completely gone, have perfect bone implant contact. The ISQ value stayed uh, high throughout the entire study period. So very, very cool and exciting material. And like I said, already used in clinical practice and uh, will be available probably for the rest of you guys in late 2020 or uh, sometime within a year. Um, enamel matrix protein is one that I've personally done a lot of work with. And so uh, we collaborated a lot with a group of colleagues. You'll see a lot of Swiss guys on this paper. So Dieter is one of the top oral uh, histologists in the world working in Bern. And uh, Tony Schoolian down here has obviously done a lot of work with EMD and endogain. Uh, and a lot of North American colleagues, Stuart Froome here, uh, David Cochran is somewhere here as well, and uh, Europeans. What happened basically was that there was a little gathering of 20 years of enamel matrix derivatives, what the, the gathering was called. And uh, these experts got together and discussed the topic, what kind of future research was ongoing. It's hard to believe that endogain has been around now for 20 years, and kind of a summary of all the work that's been done on endogain. For those that want to learn more about uh, that topic, this is a paper. It's called 20 Years of Enamel Matrix Derivative, published in the Journal of Clinical Perio uh, in 2016. And it goes over kind of how to use endogain effectively in clinical practice. So this was done with a lot of colleagues and clinicians uh, looking at how to use it for intrabony defects, how to use it for frications and recessions. And again, it depends if you have a thick biotype, thin biotype, you know, they really cover uh, how to use endogain in a lot of these different applications. Um, at the same time, a lot of emphasis was placed on future research. And so there was really four areas of future research. So one of them was related to minimally invasive surgery. These are two Italian colleagues here, Zucchelli and Cordellini. Uh, a lot of people using endogain now for the treatment of parimplantitis, role of various fractions of EMD. Uh, my group actually developed what's called osteogain, so it's also launched by Stroman, and it's a new formulation of endogain, so this is maybe a lot of you guys have never heard of this. This is something that uh, ideally will be launched in North America in the coming uh, months to two years, um, and I just want to discuss what it is. So here's endogain, for those that are familiar with it. Here's osteogain. Endogain is a gel, and the reason why it was created in a gel was because endogain was meant to be used alone. If you had a big intrabony defect, okay, you were to, or a small intrabony defect, I should say, you were to use endogain on the root surface, okay, and of course you want to use a gel for that because the liquid would be too hard to work with, and uh, thereafter you'd have periodontal regeneration. The problem with endogain is that when you use it alone in big intrabony defects, you get a little bit of flap collapse, and for that reason, many clinicians started mixing endogain with bone graft materials. Uh, the problem with doing that is that gels don't absorb proteins very well to uh, bone grafting materials. And so what we found over time was that a lot of the embryo game was actually getting rinsed off, uh, didn't have proper absorption of the proteins, and didn't maximize regeneration. Ideally, when you want to absorb proteins to biomaterials, it should be in liquid formulation, 
Okay, so that's essentially what Osteogain is, is a liquid formulation of Endogain. Same protein, same regenerative properties, but now what happens is it absorbs better to uh, biomaterials. Okay, so for those that use Endogain with either bone grafts or they use Endogain with collagen membranes or connective tissue grafts, et cetera, to biomaterials of any kind, uh, better to use the liquid formulation and that will be available probably in the near future as well. Okay, and I won uh, in 2016 a, a research prize with the ITI for having developed this technology. Um, and again, it has a lot to do with just the absorption. One of the other things that's cool about working with Osteogain as opposed to Endogain is as a liquid formulation, it's much easier to apply the liquid to bone grafts when compared to the gel. The gel, you're always having to roll it around the bone grafting materials here, whereas the liquid, you just apply the liquid and then away you go. Uh, a lot of people don't know this as well. In order to have a lot of absorption of the proteins to any type of biomaterial, you need to keep this soaked here for five minutes. Okay, so it needs to be applied, leave it there for five minutes. After these five minutes, you have proper absorption and then you can use it afterwards. I see in clinical practice way too often people making videos, etc. Somebody mixes Endogain with a bone graft in three, four, or five, six seconds and then put it immediately in an intrabony defect. Actually, the proteins are very hydrophobic and they don't absorb very well. Um, and it's better to wait longer periods of time. So we've done that research back in 2012 to show that. Okay. And again, you get better bone graft packing here with, with the Osteogain. Now, throughout the FDA uh, process uh, to get it FDA approved, of course, this was considered by uh, many a drug. Because it was a growth factor, they considered it a new drug, even though it's the same exact proteins as Endogain. And so they wanted us to go to a monkey study before we went to human studies. And I just want to show people the kind of research that we do. Uh, we did this in Japan, Tony and I, with uh, Yoshi, uh, Dr. Shirakata, who's a, a professor out in Kagoshima. And what we do in these monkey studies, actually, is we create purposely intrabony defects and percation defects. So in this study, we were going to compare Endogain uh, to Osteogain. We load both of them on a collagen sponge. And right away, when you look at the collagen sponge that's been soaked with Endogain, you can see the gel a little bit everywhere, so coming off the sides which means that the proteins are not necessarily right on or in the sponge. They're kind of, you know, soaked out here and you might not get proper absorption. With the liquid, again, it soaks right into the material and then uh, you can really assure that you have better absorption that way there. Okay, so here's monkey. Okay, these are different defects that are created. Here's some two wall defects. And what we do in these types of defects is we actually wrap ligatures around Okay, and the ligature goes around. And then afterwards, we let that sit there for two to three months. It accumulates a ton of plaque. Uh, we go back in, remove the ligature. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of infection when we remove these things, clean it out, and then we regenerate the tissues. So we'll use either Endogain or Osteogain, or we do a lot of different products here, uh, DFDBA and this type of model, et cetera, uh, and try and regenerate these tissues. For frications, what we do is we create class three frications. We put impression material. This also will accumulate a ton of plaque. Afterwards, we remove this uh, and then we regenerate these tissues. Okay? These are class three frications. Uh, again, with these studies, we found, of course, that Osteogain was uh, having better attachment. Now, um, one of the things that we've learned over time with uh, Endogain was that it's very good at soft tissue wound healing as well. And a lot of people don't know this, but actually, Endogain is also sold in the medical field under a completely different name. And it's used for the treatment of hard to heal diabetic ulcers. So a case like this, a lot of these patients here, uh, they don't even know they have these types of lesions. And it's one of the reasons why I always say growth factors is really the future of medicine. Because with growth factors, whether it be Endogain, PDGF, GEM21, whether it be uh, PRF, et cetera, that's really where you know, we need these growth factors to help these patients heal. And so sure enough, uh, Endogain was being applied and utilized for these types of procedures. And uh, after one application, you can see that there's healing. After a second application, you can see uh, even more healing. That's just with two applications of Endogain. And amazingly, uh, it's sold under a different name. It's called Zelma. And Zelma is sold in the medical field out in Europe. And it's the exact same thing as Endogain. Okay? Um, and so it's very, very interesting. Actually, we wrote a, a review article for the Journal of Periodontal Research discussing the wound healing properties uh, of Endogain. And uh, what we did was we actually went to Zelma 
all the literature on Zelma. There's 10, 15 papers on Zelma. And we just took the full list of these papers for diabetic foot ulcers, for you know, skin victims, et cetera, how they use it in those fields there. And we just showed the periodontist uh, that are working in ac academics, its application in, in those types of fields there. So uh, quite cool stuff. And you guys can read about that online as well. Rick, one now, question. As you can imagine. And yep. that is, uh, in the monkey studies, was there a control used? Was there a control used? Yeah, that's the question we got. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, in all studies, we use controls. So the controls we typically use are just blank. So that's nothing. Uh, and then we also use collagen spun alone. So that's just the collagen, the matrix. And then I would even consider endogain uh, control as well. So endogain is kind of the previous standard. And then, of course, the osteogain is the other one. So we always, in all of our studies, will have multiple negative controls. Uh, and then a biomaterial control in this case here would be just the collagen sponge. So absolutely, a very good question. Thank you. Um, okay, now this made big news. So with, with Zelma here, of course, this was uh, you know quite big news that you could repair some of these leg ulcers or hard to heal venous leg ulcers, et cetera. So just to go over the wound healing properties of EMD. And one of the interesting things that research that was done in David Cochran's lab out in San Antonio was that you could actually take endogain and literally inject it in these types of uh, angiogenic models. So just in these eggs and then quantify by new vessel growth to see what kind of angiogenic properties this stuff has. And sure enough, endogain had, you know, quite a lot of it. And at the same time that we were doing that research, uh, we were reading a lot about PRF. This was maybe, you know, eight, nine years ago. And it looked like an interesting thing because, of course, it works based on angiogenic properties. But this time here, it's completely natural, right? It's coming from your own body. You're concentrating your proteins. It made sense to use PRF instead of PRP, which we had no anticoagulants. And uh, since then, we've done a lot of research on this topic uh, and, and written a textbook on it. So the book was written in 2017. Um, I always say PRF is one of the least well-studied biomaterials uh, available in dentistry. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the biggest one being that you have to remember that when you have a centrifuge, you know, as a clinician, you're only going to buy tubes. And these tubes are literally about a dollar each. And so as a clinician, you buy maybe a hundred of these at a time for about a hundred dollars. And there's really not a lot of money for companies to actually invest in this stuff because they're reselling butterfly needles and tubes. You're, you as a clinician is buying maybe a hundred, a hundred pack two, two, three times a year maximum. And there's not a lot of profit going to the companies. When you compare that to, let's say an implant where it's 200, $300, you know, you're getting a few of these every single week or going in, in somebody's mouth, you know, there's a lot of money there. And so of course, since it's a bigger field, the implant field or the bone grafting field, there's a lot more research going into that field and no big company ever did real solid research on platelet rich fibrin. And for that reason, I always think it was very, very poorly studied in the early going. Um, today, we've learned a lot about it. Okay, a lot of different groups now are doing quite good research on it. And I still think the field is going to continue to improve over the coming years. One thing that's good about this textbook is that the clinical recommendations in the book are valid. So even though it was written two years ago, the way we use it for extraction sockets, the way we use it for sinus grafting, for GBR procedures, for perio, um, is basically the same. There's only been slight modifications. Whereas with the protocols and with the centrifuges and what we've learned on those topics and tubes especially, uh, there's been a lot of improvements over the last, I would say, two years or so. And I'll discuss some of those today. So for those that don't work with PRF, um, what you're doing essentially is you're taking blood, okay? And in blood, you typically have much fewer platelets, typically 10 times less or more platelets when compared to red blood cells. But by using a centrifuge, you can actually concentrate these cells and they separate based on cell density. So because platelets are the smallest cells, they go to the top. Because red blood cells are the heaviest, they go to the bottom. And you basically just separate these blood layers in, in, a, in a centrifuge. Okay? And I'll talk more about protocols and what you're doing later. After you spin, of course, you get an upper layer that's the you know, plasma, and you get a bottom layer, which are the red blood cells. You're going to use this PRF layer for regenerative purposes. Now, unlike PRP, which uses anticoagulants, the advantage of PRF is that there's no anticoagulants, there's no chemicals at all. It's 100% natural. And for that reason, uh, it forms a clot. 
and we call this kind of a super clot where you get a fiber matrix and uh, you get cells that are incorporated and you also get different growth factors. There are many growth factors that are found in blood, as you can imagine, uh, but you don't have them in equal levels. So one thing that people always get confused by, and you see it here in one of our papers, you know, BMP2. Well, there is some BMPs, which is bone morphogenetic protein. That's the one that makes bone in pure F, but it's very, very small quantities, right? It's so small that you might as well not even discuss it really. The main proteins that are found in platelet-rich fibrin are PDGF, which is platelet-derived growth factor. So it's the growth factor literally that's derived from platelets. So of course, we have many, many of that. Uh, second big one is VEGF, so vascular endothelial growth factor. It's a growth factor that's found for blood. And because we're concentrating blood proteins, of course, you're going to get a lot of that stuff there as well. Um, I always say one of the big advantages of PRF over PRP, and a lot of people always ask that question in, in most of the courses that we teach on PRF is, you know, when you cut yourself, let's say you, you, know, you cut yourself and you start bleeding out. The first thing that happens for wound healing to occur is a clot is formed. Clot forms, growth factors get trapped in the clot, cells get trapped in the clot, wound healing occurs thereafter, okay? Without that clot, of course, you're not gonna have proper wound healing. And so when you use things like PRP, you're actually taking chemicals that are anticoagulants that don't allow clotting. And so you'll concentrate that with the anticoagulants and then you're putting that back in your patient. So of course, there's positive effects to that because you know, you're getting a lot of platelets and they regenerate growth factors or they release growth factors. But the problem is, is that you're missing that clotting component and you're actually inhibiting it. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of work was done on platelet-rich fibrin. And it's one of the reasons also why today most people use PRF in the practice as opposed to PRP. Now, these are the three main growth factors in platelet-rich fibrin. We have VEGF, as I mentioned, vascular endothelial growth factor, which helps with angiogenesis. We have PDGF, which is platelet-derived growth factor, which helps with recruiting cells, and that's very important for wound healing. And we also have TGF-beta, and this helps with proliferation, so just the cells multiply. Now, when you think of regeneration across any field, every single one of any tissue you want to regenerate, you're always going to need these three components, right? Even if I want to regenerate cartilage, I need blood flow, I need recruitment of cells, I need proliferation of these cells. Whether I want to do hair regeneration, you need this, okay? Anything you want to do, this is always going to be in your favor. And a lot of people will say, and I hear people say, you know, PRF is, is osteoinductive. Well, if you understand what osteoinduction means, it means that it's capable of forming ectopic bone. Okay? It means you can put it in a site where bone should not be formed, for example, muscle, and you should get bone right in the middle of muscle. It doesn't do that. Okay, PRF is not an osteoinductive product. And a lot of people get confused by that. Okay? And I always say, if it was osteoinductive, like a BMP, uh, you'd, you'd be able to put this PRF stuff anywhere and it would make bone wherever you put it. That's what the definition of osteoinduction is. It doesn't do that. Um, what it's very good at though, is if I put it, let's say in an extraction socket, again, what is it gonna do? First, it's gonna help with blood flow. Second, it's gonna help with recruiting cells. Okay, which cells are gonna get recruited? Well, if I have all walls intact, I'm gonna have recruitment of bone cells from all my walls, they're gonna infiltrate the area, then it's gonna help with proliferation. So these bone cells are gonna multiply, 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 and then I'm gonna have more bone formation. Okay, it makes sense. And the randomized clinical studies show that, okay? Where do you run into problems with PRF? Let's say you use PRF in a site where you're missing a buccal plate. You put PRF in there. Okay, let's go over the biology. Vascularization, it's gonna help revascularize, that's perfect. Then it's gonna help with recruitment. Well, now I got my bone walls, it's gonna help all these bone walls infiltrate, but I also have no bone wall here, I have soft tissue. Okay, I'm missing my buccal plate. Then these soft tissue cells are gonna infiltrate the area as well. It's gonna help recruit these cells as well. And then it's gonna help with proliferation. Well, which cells multiply faster? And it's their soft tissue right? And that's where a lot of clinicians get into problems where they don't understand necessarily, you know, biologically how these different molecules are working. So when we use PRF, of course, you got to be able to do blood draws, right? And a lot of people always say, or they don't feel comfortable doing this. This is the easiest thing in the world to teach. Like I said, when I first learned how to do it, my supervisor literally said to me, look, this is something that's done by 20, 21 year old nursing students, you know, essentially uh, not very complex to do. 
Um, if you think, if you were to ask a nursing student, what would you rather do a blood draw or some of the injections we do in the oral cavity, of course, every single one of them is going to say a blood draw. I mean, reality is this is quite a lot simpler. Um, and then of course you're going to place this in a centrifuge, you're going to spin it, and then you're going to separate your layers. Now, very, very, very important because you're not using anticoagulants, you got to get this in the machine fast. Okay. And people always ask the question, how fast, and we've done the study and I'll show you later the results, answer is 60 to 90 seconds, okay? Which means you gotta have the machine in the same room, you gotta have the machine open, you gotta have it set to the right protocol, then you draw the blood, and then you put the blood immediately in the centrifuge and you start it, okay? This idea where I see clinicians, you know, drawing the blood, running to the next room, plugging in the centrifuge, selecting the right protocol, and then putting it in, big mistake. Why is it a big mistake? because you don't have anticoagulants in these tubes. So which means that this blood that you've just taken, right, it's gonna coagulate. And over time, it's literally starting to coagulate, okay? And you're using the centrifuge to separate these layers. So if you let this thing start to clot because you're taking too much time, then it's forming a little bit of a fibrin clot. You put it in a centrifuge, you start spinning, spinning, spinning fast. You can't separate the layers as well because that fibrin clot's being formed from you two taking too long as a clinician, okay? I can't stress this enough. And even experienced PRF users, I tell them, look, set a timer in your clinic. If it's your assistant that's drawing the blood, set a timer, try it. 90 seconds goes by faster than you think, okay? So we always recommend to people draw, you know, six, eight tubes maximum at a time per machine um, in order to get them in the machine fast enough and separate the layers accordingly. Now, PRP, PRF, of course, uh, here we're using anticoagulants. This is kind of older technology. You're not gonna get the fibrin clot. Um, typically, you're trying not to accumulate leukocytes, and we'll talk more about their role later. And it's often two or three, two spin cycles, I should say, um, but of course, no clotting. So here, with PRF, it's a fibrin clot, okay? You got the white blood cells, you got the platelets. It's entirely physiological. Why do we like to accumulate leukocytes? There's several reasons. Leukocytes are, of course, white blood cells. Uh, they're helpful in tissue regeneration in general. So many, many studies have shown that without these white blood cells, okay, without macrophages, et cetera, you don't have proper wound healing. Okay? You need these guys. These are the guys that kind of control what's going on in the environment, especially when it relates to biomaterials. Okay? I always say the most important cells are white blood cells, okay? monocytes, macrophages. Anytime you implant uh, an implant, a bone graft, whatever it may be, always remember that it's not a bone cell that's going on that implant and making bone. Absolutely not. It's always white blood cell. It's always a monocyte attaching or a macrophage. Okay? And it's saying, do I like this biomaterial? Do I like this implant surface? If the answer is yes, then it calls in bone cells. And then afterwards you get tissue regeneration. Okay? A lot of people get that confused. And it's one of the reasons why when your immune system is not working properly for a lot of different reasons, you're not going to optimize wound healing. And I'll talk about that later. I can't stress that enough. We've written many basic research articles on that. So with PRF, we actually concentrate these guys. Okay. Nice thing about these leukocytes, of course, is they're white blood cells that fight infection. Where do we have a lot of bacteria in the body? Oral cavity. Okay. So again, minimizing infections. And you'll see this specifically in the third molar studies. Uh, where they typically can reduce infections, dry sockets, et cetera, typically tenfold. So it's a quite pronounced uh, improvement there. Now, protocol is e extremely important. Um, done a ton of research on this. You'll see myself, uh, Tony Schoolian. You'll see a lot of Dr. Kobayashi, who's done most of our work, preclinical work as well, at the University of Bern, just looking at, you know, what's different between when PRP is released, what's LPRF, APRF, A+, all this other uh, nonsense with respect to the trademark names. I don't really care what these things are called, but I want people to understand biology, okay? Um, all that's different between the protocols is literally the spin cycles, so how fast you're spinning this. Always remember that in a centrifuge, the faster you're spinning, okay, the more cells, growth factors, et cetera, are going down to the bottom, okay? So if I spin really, really fast, I push everything to the bottom. If I go a little bit slower, stuff stays a little bit higher. And because you're taking PRF at the very top, okay, uh, one of the mistakes that was made early on, and a lot of researchers back then still admit to this day, 
They were spinning so fast because they were not using anticoagulants that they just thought, oh, no more anticoagulants. We've got to get this to the machine real fast. We've got to spin very, very fast. And the problem is majority of the cells were actually no longer found in that little fibrin clot. They're found in the red cell layer. Okay? And that's when, when they were looking at the stuff histologically, then they said, okay, first let's slow down the speed. So that's what the APRF is. Here's a slower speed. And then they said, wow, we've got better results. We've got more growth factors released. Okay, logically, what's the next thing to do? Keep the speed slower and then also reduce the time. Okay, and then by doing so, you're not pushing as many cells to the bottom. You keep them more in the upper layers. Okay, a lot of work has been done on this. This right here can be done on any machine, right? You can have an intraspin L PRF machine if you want to call it that. You can change your spin cycles and get A PRF plus on an intraspin machine. I mean, the first papers on that topic was actually done on an intraspin device. So don't think that you know you have to buy a new centrifuge or do this or do that. These things, it's just modifications. And of course we teach that in our courses. And I, if anybody ever wants to email me, like I said, I'll show my email at the end. We've tested many, many different centrifugation devices, the Salvin ones, the EBAs, the Intraspins, whatever you name it, we've tested it. And we've gotten the protocols down so that we can give this information to clinicians uh, that have these in their practices. Now, um, when we look at the growth factor release, and when I go back here, the big difference between PRP, let's say, PRP releases a lot of growth factors early and then almost nothing. Um, with the different protocols, we can release growth factors all the way up to 10 days. So the nice thing is, is we get a slow, gradual release of these growth factors long term. When we look at just nature in general, when we look at medicine in general, always remember that things grow or heal better when they have, you know, widespread use of growth factors. So example here, if you have this plant, you know, ideally, if you're going to water this with a liter of water, you're not just going to dump a liter of water on this plant. You're going to go slow drip by drip infusion, and it will grow faster. Okay. Same thing on this side. If you have a big infection, you don't just say, hey, go take X amount of grams of, of antibiotics one time. Absolutely not. We give slow doses, okay, either orally, or if it's really bad, then you go drip by drip infusion of these antibiotics. Okay. That can be the same thing with a an Olympic athlete that's on steroids, okay? I'm not promoting steroids, of course, but I'm just saying, you know, these guys don't just take steroids one time. They do slow, gradual, every day you take your doses, and that's how you optimize growth factors, okay, growth factor delivery. With PRF, you know, it's completely legal, of course, but you're getting this matrix where all these proteins are now trapped inside this fibrin clot, and what happens is as that fibrin clot gets degraded over 14 days, it's slowly getting degraded. And as it's getting degraded, it's releasing the growth factors. And those growth factors that are slowly getting released over 14 days are what's stimulating a slow and gradual uh, growth of cells or tissues. Um, in our book uh, that was written, uh, very interestingly, PRF was used first in medicine. Okay, so Dr. Shakrun is a medical doctor and he did a lot of work with uh, you know, hard to heal wounds uh, amputations. And a lot of people would look at, you know, how do you heal this type of defect? Maybe first with uh, antibiotic creams, antibiotics, and a lot of times they would not heal. Maybe coatings of PRP, injections of PRP. And then he had the idea of using these PRF clots. And so he thought, you know, with the clot, why not apply? You'll get a slow and gradual release of these growth factors. And on top of that, you now have the leukocytes that are concentrated. And with these leukocytes being white blood cells, they can fight infection. You fight the infection, you restart the vascularization, you know, you start the, the wound healing cascade. So they had a lot of success with this. And I always tell dentists, you know, we've written a textbook now on PRF. And when I went through all of the literature, and I mean, literally, we had to go through everything when we wrote the book, 65% of the indications for PRF is in medicine. Okay? It's not in dentistry or the small users. The big users and the big indications are really uh, for medical purposes. So really, really cool with some of the stuff that you see uh, when you read some of the literature. Another example here, diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, yeah, ulcer leading to amputation. Why did this happen in the first place? Okay, low blood flow. Diabetics, low blood flow. Low blood flow, amputation. But if you already have low blood flow, you're not gonna heal as effectively. Okay, so a case like this, some of these don't heal. This is 15 days later, no healing. Medical doctors apply PRF, put them in the wound here, and regeneration. Okay, super interesting. Um, and this was in the early days with, with respect to PRF. This was back here. 
Look at today. This is on PubMed, all the papers. From the year 2009 onwards, all of a sudden there's this huge increase, okay? To the point where last year, 236 publications on platelet-rich fiber. Imagine that, okay? That's literally uh, close to five per week. So you wanna stay up to date on this topic, you're literally having to read five papers per year. Okay? It's a very, very fast growing field. Every dental school that I've attended in the United States and, and done courses with or lectures, they're all using platelet-rich fibrin, whether it be in oral surgery, whether it be in perio, a uh, lot of users of this stuff here. And of course, uh, me personally, I go around the country just teaching one day platelet-rich fibrin courses on Saturdays, a little bit everywhere uh, with our organization at PureFEDU to really train people properly how to do blood draws, how to use this in different indications of, of dentistry. Um, so a couple of rules here for those that are already users. Um, you got to draw the blood fast. Of course, you're not using anticoagulants. Like I said, you got 60 to 90 seconds. You got to start that spin immediately. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of clinicians don't know about is this one here. Pop the lids following spin cycle and wait for five minutes. Why do you want to do this? Imagine if you cut yourself, right? In your body, you always have fibrinogen and thrombin that are circulating, 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 not making a clot. Why is it that when you cut yourself, all of a sudden it clots. Answer, air, air and oxygen, okay? So that's what's required for the coagulation cascade to take fibrinogen, thrombin becomes fibrin. Okay, so same thing here. If you have these tubes and you wanna have a better clot, pop the lids, expose this to oxygen, let it sit there for five minutes, the oxygen will go in there, better clot. Okay, so that's one little uh, piece of information. Now there's different types of tubes and a lot of people get confused by this. There are tubes that are made for solid PRF, okay? And there's, you know, whether you wanna call it LPRF or APRF or solid PRF, you know, make it easy, just call it solid PRF and liquid PRF. Solid PRF tubes are made specifically to make membranes and there's really a science behind that. And the white tubes or the orange tubes, there's really a science behind that as well. So platelets, um, they start clotting when they actually bind to surfaces. Okay, so just like a titanium implant surface, you know, all this research that was done by all these implant companies that say, oh, we have a hydrophilic surface or we have the most hydrophilic surface now on the market. Why do they try and do that? If you have a more hydrophilic surface, it's more water loving, which means that cells will go bind to it faster. And what happens is clotting will occur faster on those walls. So when a platelet actually needs a surface to bind to, when it binds, it will start clotting and then you'll get a nice big clot. So it needs a hydrophilic surface. Hydrophilic surfaces typically is glass or titanium, right? And you'll actually see titanium PRF tubes. Some countries will use that and biology makes sense there as well. But platelet will then bind and then clot occurs. That's a hydrophilic surface. This best material here in North America is glass or you can also use silica coated plastic. That's what another company will use. So the intraspin tubes, you'll see the silica coated plastic, which also works for clotting. The opposite is true for the other types of tubes. On the other side of the spectrum, you want a liquid, which means that you do not want those platelets to bind to those walls. So in those cases there, you need a hydrophobic surface, water pushing. So the platelet might wanna bind, but you got a hydrophobic surface and it's pushing that platelet away from it. And that is typically a PET plastic tube, okay? And that's one of the reasons why there's two types of tubes, okay? A lot of people get confused with that. And it also means that, you know, I always get laugh at people because clinicians will spend plus minus thousand, two thousand dollars on buying a centrifuge. When the centrifuge, I can take any one of those, program it properly and give virtually very similar results. But with the tubes, the tubes matter a lot because the tubes, if you have a more hydrophilic surface, it will make a much better clot, okay? And the tube difference in price, you know, vary between company between 85 cents to $1.50 or, you know, it's a, very, it's a sense. And that's what actually matters. So we've done a lot of research in that field there as well over the last year or so. Okay, PRF background. Chapter three in the textbook. Again, you can make membranes, you can make plugs, you can coat with the liquid some, some surfaces. So we'll go over this a little bit for some of the newbies here. When you spin, okay, after with PRF, um, you're gonna get your clots. Typically, you wanna remove, obviously, a little bit of the red blood cells, but you don't wanna cut the membrane so that there's no more red. 
Okay, and you'll see here, right away when I look at these, you know, these are bigger clots that are produced in some of our solid PRF tubes. You get nice big clots. Basically the whole thing is clotted and I'll talk a little bit later about the, the technology here with respect to the clots. So here we're gonna have different clots. Okay, I'm just gonna fast forward here. So just peeling these down. Um, get six different clots from six tubes, okay? Everything looks great, even size, uh, things are great. Now you can do different things with these clots. So first thing you can do, of course, for, for example, third molar extractions or extractions that have all their walls and a nice buckle plate, you can actually put these in these little cylinders, right? And then you can use this little piston here, compress this, put these in your third molar sites, okay? Nice, easy indication for it. You know, again, when you have your centrifuge, making one of these things here will literally cost you, you know, a dollar per tube plus a dollar 25 for a butterfly needle, you know, not very expensive. You can press them and then you're going to use these little plugs for uh, extraction sockets or you can use them. Uh, let's say, you know, you've got an implant that's going to go in and use your, your allograph in the extraction site. You can put this little thing on the top for soft tissue moon healing okay? and I'll show cases of that as well uh, a little bit later. Okay, so very interesting that you can use these little plugs for. Essentially what you're doing with the plugs is you're trying to concentrate all of uh, the cells that are found in this big membrane. You just put them all there. Now you've got more cells, more growth factors in this small area. To make membranes, you just basically apply the tray, okay? And it's, you just let it sit there for a couple seconds. And then when you lift this thing up, you're gonna get your membranes, okay? So they're gonna be flattened. And this is what we use typically over top collagen membranes, uh, covering Schneiderian membrane tears, right? These are gonna be your different membranes that are now flattened so that they're easier to work with. We can actually take these guys here, cut them up and mix them with bone grafts to make sticky bone, which I'll share, show in the next little video there. So you see these things, you know, they're flattened out. Um, these things are a lot stronger than people think. A lot of people think they're very flimsy. You know, you can take them and pull them. I've seen different uh, uh, opinion leaders actually hang instruments off them. Uh, it's Dr. Pinto who's done some nice work with Clearly with Ryburn as well, you can watch some of his videos online, which are uh, quite, quite cool as well. Okay, so they're, they're stronger than people think. Um, whenever we want to uh, collect and make sticky bone, we draw, here's the white cap tube. So this is in the same spin cycles. Okay, we'll have now a liquid. With the liquid here, you always want to draw, most of the cells float at what's called the Buffy coat layer. So they're actually found uh, very close to the red juncture. So what we do is we pop a needle in there. Again, you don't want to necessarily pop the lids because if you pop the lids, what happens? You start clotting. And since it's a liquid, you don't want that close to oxygen. So pop the needle through, collect all the liquid this way here. Okay. Again, I think, yeah. What we're going to, what we're going to do now is. Uh, oh, I'm not off. I just want to turn the volume down. All right. So here, when you see this little red layer right here, this is where all the cells are living, okay? The cells are typically found right there. So you have to, and I too often see clinicians that don't go all the way to this area here where that buffy coat is, where the majority of the cells are, okay? You wanna, again, take the needle, go down, be able to visualize, and you wanna go nice and close to that layer. If you get a couple of red blood cells, it's not a big deal in the dental field, right? So no big deal at all, but make sure you go and you get this layer right there, right up to the junction there, okay? So if you have assistants doing this job, make sure to let them know to, to try as much as possible to get down there. Now, to make the sticky bone, okay, another little video here, what we do typically is grab two of these membranes, okay, and I'll fast forward through this a little bit faster. What you'll see, actually, I think this video is literally uh, about a minute. That's all it takes. One minute, I can make sticky bone. So here I am, we're at 17 seconds here. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but uh, we're 17 seconds in, now we're 22 seconds in, okay? All I'm doing is I'm grabbing the scissors, cutting very, very rapidly, 27 seconds in, okay? Cut, 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 cut. All I'm doing is I'm cutting this up into about uh, one millimeter pieces, and then I'm gonna mix my bone graft with this, okay? And that's how I'm gonna make the sticky consistency. So here we are now, we're at 40 seconds, okay? I take bone graft, of course, this is way too much. I'm just making a video, but um, you mix your bone graft in there. You get it mixed up, okay? Uh, so we're just gonna mix that up a little bit. And then we take the liquid PRF. And the liquid PRF, because it hasn't clotted yet, okay? That's what's gonna help this thing really form a nice stable clot. Okay, so when it gets exposed to oxygen thereafter, 
And also when your graph material has collagen, so it's very important to have uh, allograft in here, you apply the liquid. Here we are at a minute 15, okay? And uh, you can see I don't have enough, so I just go back and grab a little bit more from another tube, and I mix that back in there. What does this make, okay? It makes what's called sticky bone. So that's this right here. After that's been mixed and it sit there for about, you know, a minute, okay? You get this consistency where this graph material is now sticky. Okay, there's the little pure fragments mixed with the allograft and the liquid. And now the nice thing about this is that if I want to do horizontal, you know, augmentations or vertical, whatever it may be, I don't have little particles flying around everywhere anymore. Okay, I got a nice consistency. If I want to do sinus augmentation, you know, you can load that in the sinus and you don't have to worry too much about the particles going around everywhere. Um, cool stuff. So when we look at platelet-rich fibrin, and all the indications in dentistry, these are kind of the outline of where it can be used. I won't go through all of them in, in great detail, but I just wanna show examples of different things that are being done. Uh, this is a case by uh, Dr. Alexander Amir, who's located in uh, University of Southern California. He's done a lot of great work and wrote the textbook chapter on gingival recessions and did a nice job. Just looking at you know, how you can take certain cases, you can't do this for all cases, but when you have a band of keratinized tissue, and you have recessions, okay? This is what people are doing, vestibular incisions. This is doctors today, this is the technique, okay? Load the PRF in there, coronal advanced flap, okay? and you'll get healing. So it's something that's, uh, you know, taught by his courses and different people are teaching courses today on this topic, which is very interesting, where you can actually regenerate such defects with platelet-rich fibrin alone and get a, a considerably nice result. Again, vestibular incisions, platelet-rich fibrin goes in, Okay, and wound healing occurs. Okay, a lot like you can use collagen. Okay? Now, this is not a substitute by any means of connective tissue graft. If you don't have keratinized tissue, you absolutely need a connective tissue graft. But there are a lot of these cases floating around, I guarantee you, in North America where you have keratinized tissue and you have a recession. Better to treat these things as early as you can. Okay? So for those that want to learn how to do some of these techniques, we teach a course down at Nova Southeastern University in Florida every year with Professor Schooley and uh, where we kind of go over some grafting options with these, these types of cases. Uh, here's a case by Dr. Zucchelli, very well known, of course, for connective tissue grafting. A case like this doesn't require connective tissue graft, right? Small little recessions, of course. Um, he does surgery completely differently, raises full flaps. Uh, but again, it doesn't matter your technique. Get the PRF in there. Of course, it's going to help with wound healing, especially soft tissue wound healing. Uh, and healing will occur thereafter. Okay, so this is Dr. Zucchelli's case here. A lot of, lot of research on this. A lot of people always ask me, yeah, there's not too much research on this. I always say, are you crazy? I mean, there's more than 22 randomized clinical studies today on this topic, comparing it to different things. You'll notice a couple of things. In all of these studies, it's always Miller class one or class two. So they don't do the more complex uh, gingival recessions. A lot of work comparing it to endogame versus PRF, you'll find similar results. Uh, connective tissue graph versus PRF, similar results. Similar results here better than coronal advanced flap alone. So significant difference. So, you know, a lot of uh, nice data. And we just recently wrote uh, a nice article about this um, with a lot of periodontal colleagues. The main limitation where people get into trouble, again, when you don't have keratinized tissue, you absolutely need a connective tissue graph. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay? So it's not for everything, it's for the easier cases. But again, it's a nice alternative. It's healthier than let's say using a collagen membrane, okay? And of course, it's cheaper for you as a clinician. So you get to use this thing that's more natural. Your patient's going to appreciate that and um, can lead to similar results to a collagen membrane. In the perio field, uh, probably the most well-known study, I would say, is this one here, was done comparing DFDBH pure efferent or bony defects. Now, this was done by a well-respected colleague here, Brian Mealy, for those that don't know him. He's the director of the program down in San Antonio. Uh, in San Antonio is where actually allografts were first utilized for clinical practice uh, in dentistry. So they've done a lot of work down with Melanig and Dr. Cochran's done a lot of work out there with these allografts and they wanted to compare kind of the standard, which is DFDBA to PRF. And in this paper, surprisingly, uh, the results were equivalent. So they were taking these intravoni defects, of course they're narrow. Uh, and for those that are periodontists in the room, I'm sure everybody can agree, one of the most important things for periodontal regeneration is to have a stable clot. And so the ability to make a stable, let's call it a super clot with loaded growth factors, platelets, leukocytes, and use that for these types of defects 
um, you know, it makes sense biologically. So here's the defects. Sorry, I was just going to go back. Okay, large interval defect here. Uh, again, narrow ones are, of course, easier to treat. But what they're doing is they're taking the membranes, they cut them up into small pieces, okay, put them in there for wound healing, and away you go thereafter. Um, and there's uh, the regeneration that's occurred there, okay. Um, so interesting studies, like I said. Again, there are more than 20 randomized clinical studies on this. Every single one of them you'll find comparing open flap bereavement versus PRF, you're going to get better results. There's no question. I'll show you later what we're doing today. Again, DFDBA versus PRF, no difference here. Um, the big study that was surprising was the one by Chadwick. So that's the one that was done in San Antonio. And again, they found no difference between uh, DFDBA or PRF, which was very surprising um, and kind of encouraging as well. In extraction sockets, uh, it doesn't make bone as well as an allograft. So there's been randomized studies where the allograft's performing better. It's not something that we do in standard practice. Where we do use PRF alone, of course, is for uh, third molars. And that's great, great, great indication for it. And I don't know if I'm going to show the studies, but it typically reduces um, infection tenfold in these molar cases. Um, another place where it's very frequently utilized, of course, for sinus grafting. Here's a case that was done by uh, one of my good colleagues and friends, Dr. Michael Picos, where um, whether it's lateral approach, crustal approach, you know, if you get a tear, you can always cover these with PRF. Uh, here he's using the Picos uh, technique where he's covering the Snyderian membrane. Um, and anyways, the graft material, let's talk about this. What is utilized here? Typically, you'll have an a bone graft complex. So typically that's an allograft mixed with a xenograft, but different people are doing different things and I understand that. but uh, preferences in, in my textbook, of course, as well, is a combination of both. But here, that's your bone graft. And with that bone graft, that's 50% of this mixture. The other 50% is literally just pure F, cut up into small fragments. You mix it together, you make your sticky bone. And the advantage of doing this is many folds. One, okay, you're going to increase angiogenesis in the, in, the, in the sinus, which is great. Okay. Two, you're going to include leukocytes into the sinus. So of course, sinus is one of the areas where there's a slightly uh, increased chance of infection. So of course, there's no harm there in putting leukocytes in there. And three, imagine if I'm doing a very large augmentation where I need six cc's or eight cc's of bone graft, now half of it's actually bone graft material, the other half is PRF, which means that I've just cut my bone graft material cost down because I'm putting PRF in there, okay? Heals the same. In fact, some studies show that it heals a little bit faster. Uh, makes a lot of biological sense. So here again, here's three, four of these membranes. Dr. Pico's cutting them up. Here's my PRF. Here's this mixture, his bone graft complex. And then of course, implants goes in, packs it, uh, a collagen membrane over top. And you can put a few PRF membranes here to improve the soft tissue wound healing. So again, uh, clinically, uh, and scientifically, very, very sound procedure the way that Dr. Picos does this. We just had a course actually uh, this past weekend. There was 37 participants uh, teaching them how to do these, these draws and, and mixing these different biomaterials. Like I said, if anybody ever gets a chance to come and see us down there, it's a real, real great course. Now, where we see a lot of mistakes, okay? A lot of people will use PRF alone in a sinus cavity, and I completely, completely, completely uh, don't want to forbid you from doing it, but I want you to consider uh, what you're doing. And so in one of the articles that we wrote in Compendium in 2018, we kind of went over what a standard should be, and it had to do with the sinus width. Okay, And I'm not going to go over the whole thing, what to do when, but if you have an extremely narrow sinus, then you can use PRF alone. Okay, that's really the only place where we really advise using PRF alone, very narrow sinus. And in fact, many studies have shown that you can literally do nothing and these things will heal because the sinus is so uh, narrow and there's bone walls basically everywhere. Anytime the sinus is wider, we highly recommend using a bone graft. And you'll see a lot of speakers at different conferences say they only use PRF on and on and on. Um, from a logical point of view, bone grafts, of course, are making bone better than, than PRF is, that's for sure. And more importantly, when you're doing these quite, uh, quote unquote, more invasive procedures, uh, expensive procedures, it's just not worth the risk to maybe not make the bone because you only use PRF. And so it's one of the highlights that we made in this article. So I highly recommend reading that one. If anybody wants it, you can email me at the end and I'll send it to you guys. Implants, great place to use PRF. Not for the actual implant, of course, 
like I said, you're not really going to improve bone formation or bone implant contact on these implants. In fact, I did some research in 2006, 2007, looking at trying to incorporate endogain on an actual implant surface. And uh, in vitro, everything looked great, you know, made biological sense, whatever. The minute that we take these implants and we start screwing in them into bone, what would happen? Just the sheer force of these implants spinning, all the proteins on the implant surface completely get wiped out. Okay? It's one of the reasons why you don't find any implants with any type of growth factors on them. It doesn't work very well. So I see these doctors, sometimes they take the PRF and they dip the implants in there. Um, I always joke around, I call it like baptizing your implants, you know, one, two, three. This type of thing uh, is not shown to be scientifically proven or improve uh, bone implant contact as of yet. Uh, I don't think it ever really will be. But where PRF is useful is for soft tissues. And these immediate implants, especially when you have, for example, a molar case that's you know, 10 millimeters in size, you got this big hole and you got a five millimeter implant in there. You got, you know, five millimeters, essentially 2.5 millimeters all around this thing, open space. And that's open space for bacteria to attach to the implant. And I always say, if bacteria attach the roughened portion of that implant, you know, you as a clinician, you just started periimplantitis. And there's really no way of going back from that. Okay? There's no real guaranteed treatment. Uh, I always say to clinicians, the most important day of every implant's life is the day that you place that thing, okay? And immediate implants come with a higher risk, there's no question, uh, and you got to take care of it. And one thing that you can do very simply is just put PRF here around your healing abutments, um, cover screws, whatever it may be. Again, imagine a case like this, implant goes in, you got an opening, you just pack PRF in there. PRF can stay you know, outside in the oral cavity, no problem at all. Don't need to worry about infection. In fact, if you're a bacteria, that's the last place you want to land is on this PRF membrane. Why? Because it's got a super concentration of leukocytes, right? You got to be real careful with this now. Uh, again, packing it here. And again, you get nicer soft tissue wound healing. I'm sure for those that actually work with PRF, you've had experience just seeing the soft tissue heal a little bit faster uh, than usual. These are just different cases here. One of the things you'll see with PRF as well is that, you know, you don't have to be so beautiful with it. It's part of your own body. And, uh, you know, you can really see that it's, this is kind of awfully placed, if you want to call it. It's just kind of hanging off over the edges. But the body naturally knows, you know, genetically what size it should be, okay? And it's one of the things with PRF and people use it in facial aesthetics. Or, for example, you take PRF and you inject the papilla. You blow the papilla up. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna help regenerate your papilla? The answer is no, okay? Genetically, your papilla is not supposed to be that big or you're missing the bone, it's not gonna get that big. And it's the same thing in the facial field. When we take PRF, the plasma, we inject it in somebody's lips and some girl wants you know, these big, big size lips, can't do it. Looks great for a couple of days and then after a while, it shrinks, okay? Body genetically is not supposed to be that big, okay? Where's PRF great for in facial aesthetics? Well, let's say you got a patient, 65 years old, starting to have big nasal labial folds. Genetically, once upon a time, you were supposed to be a certain, you know, appearance. That's where it's effective. Okay, that's where it's effective there. Um, so again, just understand how that that works. Um, again, here's a case after seven days. That same case. Look at how nice this looks, right? Soft tissue wound healing. Everything's looking good. So very, very effective for soft tissues. Now with implants. Um, you know, we wrote one really interesting article, and I wrote this with Homley Wang and a couple of his uh, students slash colleagues now in Ann Arbor when I was living there writing the PRF book. We wrote this article called, called Basis of Bone Metabolism Around Dental Implants During Osteointegration and Parimplantitis. And it was a very technical article, right? Where I'm at the University of Ann Arbor, best school in all of North America for research and on and on and on. And we're talking about implants and how important vitamin D levels are, bone, how immune cells are discussed as key regulators and these cells are crucial and on and on and on. And sure enough, I got an email one day and it said, congratulations, uh, Dr. Myron, we're pleased to announce that your article, Basis of Bone Metabolism, is one of the top 20 most downloaded recent papers between July 2016 and June 2018. I remember getting this email scratching my, set, uh, scratching my head and saying, I can't believe out of everything that we've published on PRF, on Tetronite, on Emdogain, Osteogain, and all these cool things that we're doing, and this article here on basis of bone metabolism around implants is the one that's being most downloaded and most read. I couldn't believe it, I was scratching my head. 
And what we learned from the article actually was how keen actual scholars were towards this type of research and how important it was for clinical practice. And we've launched a whole bunch of research projects since then. And uh, this is one that I always find in Europe, it's very well known. In North America, people are a little bit uh, less cognitive, let's say, of how important overall health is for integration of biomaterials. Vitamin D is one of these vitamins that's, I cannot express how important it is. It's important for immune cell health. It's important for, you know, not having depression. It's important for uh, blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, multiple sclerosis. But most importantly, vitamin D is well known as, you know, the vitamin for bone, right? You get osteoporosis, your mom has osteoporosis, your wife has osteoporosis. First thing that doctor does, vitamin D, vitamin K. Absolutely. Why? These are the vitamins for bone, right? It helps with calcium absorption, etc. cetera. Um, and so it's one of the first vitamins we have for bone. And when you think about it, we are implantologists playing in bone all day long. Much of the population is deficient in this very important vitamin for bone, yet we have no idea about it. We have no idea what the levels are. We don't typically care. And uh, a lot of people started publishing two neglected risk factors for bone grafting, you know, vitamin D and cholesterol. Uh, there's been a lot of work. This right here, Toby, Toby is somebody that I work with in Ann Arbor. And, uh, you know, a lot of dental schools back in 2014, 15, 16, somewhere around this time, they started seeing that these implants were failing. You know, you know sometimes you have cases where, you look at the bone, it's a slam dunk case. You're like, this is gonna be so easy. You raise your flaps, you place your implant in and uh, everything's great. And then all of a sudden, you know, four weeks later, six weeks later, implants a spinner. Patient comes back, spits it out. And you're just like, huh, what the hell happened? You know, imagine we're working at the university. I'm working at the University of Bern, you know, one of the top dental schools in the world. And we're getting these things spitting out. And we're saying, this makes no sense. And so some colleagues, you know, what we would do is we'd say, okay, medical school's right across the street. We're working at university. Let's figure out what's going on. I bet you, I bet you these, these patients, they're deficient. They must be deficient in, in something. Or what I thought personally, I was like, you know what? All these people are allergic to implants. You know, they must be allergic to one of these titanium alloys, or maybe they're allergic to zirconia because we're starting to place zirconia implants back then or something's going on. And so when we would run them all for tests, Everybody came back with no allergies to titanium or any of the alloys, none. What would happen? Vitamin D deficiency, vitamin D. And then we found vitamin B12, okay? And then people started reporting other things. Maybe boron, for example, is one that is associated with early implant failure. And, you know, research is continuously ongoing in this field here. And it's to say, you know, even as a dentist, and, and a lot of times in dentistry, you know, we get this square vision where we're only working in the oral cavity and only place we're looking, but always pay particular attention to that person's health, okay? And uh, vitamin D is an important one. It's something that we recommend now for all of our implant patients, uh, especially after this study here came out. This study here was a big one, a monster one in the field, low serum vitamin D and early implant failure. Why was it so important? 2,000 implants were investigated in about 1,000 patients. It was published last year, about a year ago. And in the study, overall implant failure, 4%, makes sense. Heavy smokers, of course, if you're going to smoke 15 cigarettes a day or more, 6%, makes sense. 50% increase, 4% to 6%. Perio disease, generalized perio, 6%, 50% increase. Vitamin D deficiency, 11%, okay? From 4% to 11%. That was literally a threefold increase, okay? It was monstrous. And that's when we really started to look more uh, into this field and how important it is. Now, um, I've written, if anybody wants this, it's a great, 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 it's a book chapter. It was a book chapter specifically on vitamin D in the book called uh, Vitamin D Deficiencies. And uh, interestingly, in this, in this book chapter, they asked uh, me to write a chapter on its link with dentistry and implant failure. So we wrote one and we, we looked at the literature. This is a very simple, you know, 10 page read, got a lot of good info in it. And it just basically explains that sometimes you got all this bone in the world, you place these implants in, you're happy, 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 because everything looks so easy, radiographs look good. And then one month post-off, one implant's already out, the other one looks catastrophic. What happened in these cases here? Everybody's got cases like this. I mean, if you've never had a case like this, you just have not placed enough implants. 
Okay, you will run into this. And one of the things we've learned is that almost 100% of these patients, vitamin D deficiency. First thing we do when we have a patient like this, what do we do? Say, Mrs. Smith, I need you to go do a blood test. I'm almost sure that you're vitamin D deficient. Okay. And uh, what's been good about that, in a sense, is that you know, of course, as a clinician, you're always going to feel bad when you have anything fail, right? It's the last thing in the world that you want. It's not good for you. It's not good for your patient. It's not good for your reputation. It's not good for your practice. And a lot of these patients will actually come back and say, oh, Dr. Meyer, Dr. Meyer, you won't believe it. I was critically deficient when I did my test. Uh, I went and saw my medical doctor too. And he said, immediately, I got to go on vitamin D. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you're just sitting there saying, wow, you know, what a change. You know, you're Last night you had a sleepless night and today, you know, patients coming back to you and, and uh, you know, a totally different story. Um, since then, of course, now we have recommendations for dentists um, and we've worked very closely with uh, the Endocrine Society. And so here is just a paper on the proper vitamin D supplementation guidelines. These are not set by dentists. This is literally uh, the American Board of Endocrinology. So Endocrine Society of USA. Deficiency is always 30 nanograms or lower. Ideally, you want to be between 40 and 60, okay? When you do surgery, you always want to be between 40 and 60 because stress in general will actually drop your patients, okay? So we try and aim a little bit higher because when they go through stress of surgery, you know, you got you to gotta prepare for that. Adults in general should be taking about 1,500 to 2,000 units per day. When you're obese, okay, you need three times more, okay? And then, of course, anybody that's deficient, Okay, you got a supplement and typically supplements is typically around 5,000 units per day. Uh, elderly, you can take up to 10,000 and you want about 50,000 per week. Okay, so easily you can do 5,000 units per day for 12 weeks is what they recommend for anybody that's deficient. Now I can tell you for anybody that works in dentistry, uh, 12 weeks is a long time. If I need to place an implant, 12 weeks is way too long. And since then, of course, there's been multiple uh, modifications to the supplementation guidelines. I'll discuss them in a little bit. A lot of people don't know about this too. You can check vitamin D levels in your own practice. It takes 10 minutes, okay? There's a vitamin D tester. You test it the same way that you test glucose, finger prick, okay? Very easy to do. I got a little video here. It's a little device like this, okay? And... Uh, teach how to use this thing in my biomaterials course. I'm not going to spend too much time with the video here just to save you guys all some time. But essentially, it's a finger prick. You draw up some blood, okay? You got a buffer. You mix the blood with a buffer, okay? You just shake it a little bit like this. And then you place it in this little device, okay? You let it sit there. And as it's sitting there, depending on how much vitamin D you have, the levels read differently. So let's just... Uh, a buffer that helps that go and then you put the the device on it and it'll give you a reading okay, this thing's 94 percent accurate it's been tested in many studies i've tested it in a study as well with 100 different patients just to confirm that it works very very easy to do like i said uh this one here is a 15 minute test there's a 10 minute one and a 15 minute one that's all you got to do okay very 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 straightforward and then i'll show you i'll just advance this video a little bit it comes a little card that tells you what to read I'm sure some of you guys are using this already, but you know, for many people, this is, they never heard about it. So there's the reading, 50.2 nanograms per ml. Okay, that's it. Then I can confidently say that, hey, I'm gonna place an implant in this patient or I'm gonna do a full arch case. Why would I ever do a full arch case with 11% implant failure rates in somebody that I already know is vitamin D deficient? Never happened, right? For the last, for, for several years now, we check all big cases to make sure that they have ample vitamin D levels. Okay, very, very important for implant dentists. Now, antioxidants, another thing that's important too. A lot of work's been done. This is 2011. This is Pat Allen. People probably know him, the periodontist in the room. Very good periodontist. Just talking about antioxidants and how important it is to eat well. And we all know this, but nobody really follows it. Uh, but in any event, you need antioxidants. Antioxidants fight oxidative stress. Okay, And very important in the periodontal field, like I said, Ian Chappell's done a lot of great work in this field here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the United States, take a look at this. This is a general population in the US. Okay? Look at the vitamin D, 70% deficiency. Imagine that. Probably a lot of you guys don't know this, right? Imagine that the most prevalent vitamin is the one for bone. And I'm sure 
majority of you guys are implant pathologists, right? Placing implants. And meanwhile, we have to face this kind of uh, deficiency with respect to this vitamin that's relevant for bone. And it's a very cheap vitamin. And it's a vitamin that very easily you can just tell every single patient, hey, I want you to take 5,000 units per day for the next four to six weeks. You know, I want to make sure that you're not vitamin D deficient when I, as a clinician, I'm going to place that implant in. Okay, it makes perfect sense, right? So uh, there's recommendations, and I highly recommend people reading the book chapter on that topic because there's a lot of uh, important info in there. Um, you know, when I was started on this research, I started working a lot with nutritionists as well. And uh, I flew out to California quite a lot and flew out to Utah, two places that uh, do research with some of the, the nutritionists that are out there that know a lot about vitamins, because of course I don't know nearly as much as anybody, any of those people do. But sadly, uh, they were telling me, and this is still true to this day, life expectancy every year from the year 2014 all the way to 2019 over the last five years, life expectancy is going down, not up. It is the first time it's ever happened. So, which means that if you have a kid that's born today, he is expected to live less long than you as his parent. And that's kind of an awful feeling. Um, and this has a lot to do with what? Heart disease, right? Eating right, exercising, don't smoke. It's very simple things. But the reality is, is that in today's modern world, more of us are not exercising, more of us are eating fast foods, more of us are getting improper nutrition. And so when you look at people across the board, and I do the testing, like I said, in a lot of my courses, I actually test people. Dentists are the worst. Dentists, doctors, lawyers, most stressful people on the go. The busier the people are, the worse they're eating. And then we test them and their scores are awful. And now we say to them, look, antioxidants are what are gonna prevent you from getting cancer. And your levels are strikingly low, lower than the average population because you work too much, you fly too much, you eat too poorly, you don't have time to exercise. Um, and so, you know, something should be said about that just in general health. Now for us as clinicians, you know, when you jump on the other side, I don't wanna place implants or do bone augmentation procedures in patients that are deficient in some of these important vitamins for wound healing. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Dentomedica was created and it's basically just a supplementation guideline for patients that are about to go into surgery and specifically implant surgery. So I can talk a lot about the research that we've done. Like I said, I can give a, an hour and a half course just on this one topic alone. Um, but I just want to give a brief overview so that people are aware of it. Of course, supplement business is, of course, a big one. Uh, this is where we did some of the work with some of these colleagues here, uh, that I've had the pleasure to work with on some of these different topics. And uh, essentially what it is, is it's like a super dose of antioxidants so that no matter what level your patient comes in, they're getting a super dose of antioxidants and vitamin D for bone that allows you as a practitioner to know that three to four weeks later, you can place your implants and they guarantee that your patient's not gonna be deficient anymore. Okay, and they've done all the testing and on and on and on to make sure that that happens. Um, one cool thing that we do, and I take this around with me a little bit uh, when I go to different courses, just to test people at conferences, et cetera, they have scanners now where you can actually measure antioxidant levels in your hand. Uh, which is cool. So I got one of these things here free and uh, I got to do a lot of research with it was, was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, when we were doing these studies, one of the things that we noticed, here's the smoking diagram. When you are a smoker, it is by far the worst thing for antioxidant levels. It is unbelievable. When we tested smokers, they were, they tested the worst. You could be a 300 pound, you know, fat person and your scores were not as low as a very skinny, healthy looking smoker. Okay. The minute I would see a low score, I'd ask, oh, do you smoke by the way, Mrs. Smith? The answer, yeah, you know, I smoke from time to time. What's time to time? No, oh, 10 times a day. Okay. Smoking worse. And when you, when you know this, that's, these are the people that you should be, you know, more worried about, right? Smokers, diabetics, low blood flow, low antioxidant scores, and you as a clinician should start thinking, you know, how do I make sure that when I do surgery in these people that I'm at a comfortable level when it comes to their antioxidants and other things uh, to improve my chances, right? That's essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, here you can see the BMI. And again, this is not nearly as bad. So even with body fat index of 35% or higher, not even close to as bad as smoking. Now, naturally, the more veggies people would eat, the higher they were. I mean, there's no brainer there. Um, but more importantly, 
What was cool with this is that when we had people that were supplementing, when they took one of these packs per day versus two packs, we could literally in four weeks get them from a low level and pop them right up very, very rapidly. Here's a group of 60 patients here. Um, and, you know, really make sure that they're at the right levels. Um, and so that was cool. And, and that was Dentomedica, some of the research that we did. Again, two times per day, there's a morning formula, an evening formula. You just tell your patients very easily. You can either go online, go buy this stuff before they go into implant surgery. You can also carry it in your offices and just say, here you go. You know, you're going to buy this. I recommend it highly. You do your job. You talk to them about how important vitamin D is. You can read the book chapters. Away you go with this, okay? At the very, very, very least as a clinician, just encourage them to take 5,000 units per day. They can go pick that up in a vitamin shop for 20 bucks. Very important for uh, you know, minimizing implant failures, okay? This one here is obviously specific. It's got all the antioxidants. Uh, with vitamin D, it's very important as well to take vitamin K. So that's one thing that we obviously recommend uh, for sure, go hand in hand. Uh, boron is an important one for bone, magnesium, manganese. So there's a lot of cofactors that are in there that I've learned about since then uh, when we we're doing some of this research. Okay, PRF, the liquid PRF. A lot of people wanted to learn about this at the FAP, so I just wanted to include a little bit in here. When we spin at slower times and the right tubes, so these are the hydrophobic tubes, we can use this liquid PRF for different procedures. And again, when you're using this stuff, always remember not popping the lids, right? You're not gonna pop the lids. You don't want oxygen through there. You go through the lid, okay? And you're gonna draw up the liquid PRF here. Okay, draw that up and then we can use that for different procedures. Here's some cases in facial aesthetics, okay? Um, you know, we do a lot of this stuff here in facial aesthetics. Look at the folds here, you know, injections of PRF, just regenerating these tissues. 100% natural, right? I always say to people, you know, one thing that I'm always worried about is, you know, putting uh, products, polymers, you know, garbage materials in people's bodies when they don't need to. Um, and this is a really nice natural way where you can put really rich fibrin in here um, and help these, these patients kind of regenerate their tissues. I'm going to skip over this video right here just for time. And uh, I just want to go to the microneedling portion just to show people what it is. This is something that you can do as a dentist, okay? Very, very easy to do, okay? All it is is a little tutorial. It's amazing. You know, some of these ladies, they actually make these little self, let me show you how to do microneedling. And some of these videos will literally get watched on YouTube like a million times, okay? Very, very, very popular. Of course, I live in Florida. Uh, this right here, we teach facial aesthetic courses with PRF. I mean, there are just a ton of, a ton of the population that has these things, these types of procedures done, okay? We typically charge six to $800 to do such a treatment. They can be done in 20, 30 minutes. Very low overhead costs, okay? Results are, are quite nice. So this is just a little video on it. And we use the microneedling device. That's called a Dermapen. So for those that want to learn more about that, um, you can contact me as well or go on our website. Website that we use is purefedu.com. So it's just uh, uh, where we teach a lot of our PRF courses, okay? Again, look at what you can do with some of these old wrinkles with the microneedling, okay? Amazing. Look at this case here, actually. This is a nice one. And this follows very good biological principles. It was done by one of our participants and this lady doctor uh, has done a lot of research with us as well, her daughter especially. And uh, look at all of the acne. And when you think of acne, right, you're thinking infection. And when you think about PRF and you have the leukocytes, you say, hey, let's get those leukocytes in there. We take that little microneedling device, okay? And we push the leukocytes inside these little infected areas. This was her result after three treatments, okay? It's, it's shocking, right? It's life-changing. It's life-altering for this man. I mean, this man probably has had acne his whole life. I mean, he's not a teenager that has acne. He's had it for a while. And again, with the microneedling, you know, the results are quite impressive. People will use it for hair regeneration as well, okay? That's being utilized quite frequently. Um, this is actually, I wonder if I can turn up the volume. Uh, I'll just play this video. This is actually the main educator in our facial aesthetics course, the medical doctor. Today, I'm with hair loss. When we treat hair loss, we have two objectives. One is to thicken what they already have there, and two is to possibly regrow some of the hair they've lost. So today, we're actually doing a triple treatment, um, which is three very different treatments, and one is cutting edge and actually a clinical trial known as BES, which is bioelectrical stimulation. So we're going to get right to it and go step by step and show you how this is done. So the first step is... 
So I'm not going to show you guys how to do the blood draw. Everybody knows how to do that and spin. Uh, I just want to show you guys how easy this is. I mean, uh, just talking about the Purath. This right here, all she's doing is collecting up a little bit of liquid Purath. It's just injections on the scalp. Okay? Um, Dr. Coz, here is quite One centimeter clear. apart. But I make lines a centimeter apart so that I never miss an area. Okay, so if we do the injection technique, I go about two millimeters deep. Always be careful because, because the scalp's a high pressure skin, you can have a backsplash. So I use a, a, a lure lock needle so my needles are really tight and I just inject slowly. And I'll just go line after line um, and I'd mark out all the areas. So there's some nice fluff here that we want to grow. Mm -hmm. So I'd also just quite sensitive here that go along go a hairline a centimeter apart. Now I'm going to show you the second technique, which is slightly less invasive. So, Dr. Carl's been very compliant. Um, campaign. These Had type of procedures amazingly are like $2,000. And it needles everywhere. Super, so I like super easy to do. And we collaborate with a lot of medical doctors there. that do this. This is one of them. Yeah. So she's our educator, main educator. And, and uh, she's the one who wrote the facial setup. Book. And we know we've achieved this because it's a nice golden liquid. So the derma pain we use a so lot look at the needles here. Skin okay. and hair. That's all and it's doing. You can your depth. The needling effect itself is regenerating, but it's also pushing my product into the skin, which is especially important in this case. So once again, using my comb, I'm going to get the substance into the hair. So it's very important just to go a little bit behind where the thinning has occurred so that we do a little bit of a prevention or further thinning. So it's also preventative treatment. Yeah. The best part of today is the scalp massage, although it's a bit numb. So we don't waste any of this beautiful Okay, so very, very easy procedures. Like I said, facial aesthetics is being a, a, a market that's really being dominated right now by, uh, by dentists, actually. So more and more dentists, just to go over the numbers, there's about 7,000 plastic surgeons in the United States. Uh, there's now, I think it was 26,000 in the last year's report, 26,000 dentists that now do plastic, uh, not plastic, minimally invasive facial aesthetics. And uh, they actually dominate the market. Most of the big users of Botox today are actually dentists uh, and no longer plastic surgeons. So it's quite interesting to see kind of the trends in there. Uh, we teach with 12 different educators. So we have many, many experts. We have a professional photographer that teaches you how to do photography. We have three laser experts. So they do Photona laser. Uh, we have the two dermapens, so the microneedling ladies. They come right from the company headquarters. They're the clinicians that do it there and uh, two plastic surgeons and uh, four dentists that do this routine in their practice that help teach the course. So it's a big course. Uh, we have many, many aesthetic chairs. Uh, what we did actually a couple of years ago was uh, working with the organizer and they said, you know what we should do? We should just write uh, an ad and put it in Craigslist and say, anybody that wants free facial aesthetics, come to this location on this date. And of course I'm working at Nova and uh, this is in Fort Lauderdale, Miami. And as you can imagine, we had literally a lineup of 20, 25 to 100, you know, girls that were 30 years old and they were all just lined up. And it was kind of cool because it allowed a lot of the participants in the class to actually practice and do the different things literally as much as you want to the point where a lot of the doctors were just leaving because there's just so many patients to treat. And uh, by 5 p.m., you know, we still had a lineup of like 50, 50 patients to treat. Um, so good, good course to get some practice. Again, we do everything live. So... Uh, everything's taught and then we have the different aesthetic chairs there so if anybody wants to learn how to do any of this stuff here like i said in majority of states apart from maybe california this is completely uh legal from you know neck all the way up to forehead you can do uh, practically whatever you want in most of the states the only one that's tricky is california okay um some of the prf research that's been more groundbreaking i would say from uh preclinical research uh and this led to the development of what's called the bio prf system when we do PRF research and we're trying to separate blood layers, and this will allow you to actually get a, a better centrifugation device. What people were doing was that they would spin the blood and then you'd get a liquid component of plasma and then the red blood cell layer. They would take out this liquid component and then they would send that to a CBC and say, okay, how many platelets do I have? How many leukocytes? How many MAC? Whatever. Just do the CBC and compare it to baseline values. And the problem that some people reported with doing it this way here was that 
Some protocols, you have all your cells right at the base of the Buffy code and almost nothing up here. And then other protocols, the cells will be evenly distributed. And by utilizing that method, you can never tell, you know, what's better, what's worse, et cetera. And so my group developed a protocol where we actually started taking these uh, tubes and we would separate it one cc at a time. We take every single one of these layers and we'd send it off for CBC count, okay? And so we'd go layer by layer, one, two, three, all the way up to 10. And then we'd send that for a CBC count. Now, one thing you'll notice here in layer five, you actually see that half the layer in one of these layers is gonna be yellow and the other half is gonna be red. And that layer there, we always mark with little arrows and that's called the Buffy coat layer. Okay, and then of course, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way down. So when we do this, for those that have an interest spin device, okay, when you spin in an interest spin, okay, I don't typically like this protocol anymore, and I'll show you why. Um, again, here's layer five, so that fifth layer, yellow and red, that's where the Buffy coat is. And look what happens with the spin. There's just another picture here. So here's the data. Number of leukocytes, number of platelets, lymphocytes, red blood cells, neutrophils, and monocytes. And of course, this is the control. When you look at the red blood cells, you see the red blood cells obviously start at layer five when you start to see red, and then they go all the way down. Well, look at the platelets. You have no platelets in the upper four layers, and then you got a bunch of platelets right there. And you got no platelets or no leukocytes, and you got a bunch there. In fact, you have more of them in the bottom layer here, in the red, where the pure up is taken up here. Okay, and then what this told us is basically you're spinning so fast when you spin at 2700 RPM for 12 minutes that most of your cells are getting pushed right to the middle layer or even worse, all the way down. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why protocols have obviously been changed since then. That was many years ago that people changed these protocols. This right here was the APR protocol. So this is a slower spin, 1300 RPM for eight minutes. Okay? And what you see now is you get more even distribution of these platelets, okay? which is obviously a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, you still don't get the proper distribution of the leukocytes here, and I'll tell you why this happens on one of the following slides. Um, and just to summarize between the LPRF protocol and the APRF one, again, this can be done on any machine, right? I can make an LPRF protocol on any machine or an APRF protocol on any machine uh, on the fixed angle. The difference is one of them spun at high speeds, so all the cells concentrate there. Lower speeds, they concentrate throughout. And that's where you're gonna have obviously a better regeneration. I always say, imagine you take a full size membrane and you wanna lay this down as a GBR procedure, you know, you're closing up your flaps and all of a sudden there's only cells in one little area, okay? Completely useless. Well, not useless, but you know, it can be optimized. And so um, with respect to the different machines, it's always important to understand that they're all different, right? They're all different sizes, they're all different angles, they have different R maxes and R mins and uh, the companies like to play along with one another, or I should say fight with one another over, you know, my protocol is better than yours, et cetera. So it's, I always like to explain to people, you know, what's going on with these different devices. Always remember that, you know, this is spinning around uh, an axis, right? This is your rotor. And so like if I hold a kid, you know, and I start spinning this kid, if I spin him at one rotation per second and I'm just spinning around one rotation per second, that kid will receive a certain G-force. Well, imagine now I hold him on a string and he's you know, held way out there and I just go, same thing, one rotation per second, I'm spinning him around, you know, he's flying around, still exactly the same RPM. Well, of course he gets a much bigger G-force and it's exponentially bigger, obviously, the further away that he goes, okay? And so the protocols and the RPMs mean absolutely nothing. What matters is the G-force that's produced, okay? So that's, that's point number one that's extremely important. And what I see sometimes is that one company will come out with a protocol and they say, we're spinning at 2,500 RPM and our machine's this big. Well, another company will say, well, we spin at 1,500 and 1,500 is better, but their machine is this big. Well, at the end of the day, it's exactly the same G-force, okay? And that's where the companies, they like to play with each other. Where the companies make mistakes is, you know, Salvin was one of them and I, I love the company and I love everybody that works at the Salvin company. Uh, dearly, it's a great company, but reality is it's an instrument company, right? And so the Salvin was, they took the protocols of the interest spin, let's say at 2,700, and they got a bigger machine, but they're still spinning at the same RPMs. So you can't take a machine that's 2,700 RPM, that's this size, 
And then another company comes along and says, hey, 2700 I read in the literature is the right RPM. I'm going to buy a centrifuge and sell it because a lot of people are using PureF now. You get a machine that's this big and you still spin at 2700 or 3000 right? What are you doing? You're pushing all the cells to the bottom of the tube, okay? And you're taking PureF from the upper portion of the tube. And that's where a lot of the companies, you know, needed kind of our group to do the research to, to figure out, you know, how to, how to optimize the situation. Now, um, this is live uh, cell size. So this is a platelet. Here's a red blood cell. Here's a white blood cell. Again, platelets are the smallest ones. And I want to talk about this a little bit later uh, to look at how cells separate. One of the problems that we see with a fixed angle centrifuge. So these are the centrifuges that you know, you got two types actually. You got a horizontal one, so it swings up and it goes horizontally, or a fixed angle, it goes up and down on a fixed angle. The problem with a fixed angle centrifuge, and I know probably a lot of you guys that use these are, if you're a little platelet up here, you're gonna go, you know, boom. First thing when this thing starts spinning, all the cells go to the back walls. Okay, and I'll show examples of this later. So if you're a little platelet down here, first thing that happens when things start spinning, you go boom against the back wall. And then you got to, because you're lighter, climb up this hill as it's spinning. If you're a big red blood cell and you're up here, you go boom against the back wall. And then you got to go down because you're heavy. Well, the problem on a fixed angle here is that all the big red blood cells are big and they're coming down and they're going down that back wall. And the little platelet is trying to come up and he's banging into the red blood cell who's heavy and pulling him down. Okay. Not so effective at, at, at uh, separating layers. And think about it just logically. You're a little playlist down here. You know, you start spinning in the next eight to 12 minutes. You got to go from down here all the way up here. You got to climb up this mountain while all these red blood cells are coming down and trying to prevent you essentially from getting up. When you go horizontally, okay, the cells they easily just free pass. Okay. And that is a big improvement over this. Okay. Doesn't matter which angles you use here or which, you know, the radius is here. As long as you calibrate it properly, you can get similar results. But this type of device will function a lot better than this one here. So our research team started doing a lot of research with uh, these types of devices and not to go into all the details and, you know, RCF values, etc. But there's, there's obviously a whole science to that. So for those that have never seen horizontal centrifuge, okay, the way it works is the tube's going up and down. And then as the thing spins, they actually flip right out. Okay, so if you don't have a centrifuge now, you know, ideally you get one that's horizontal because as it's flipping, then those cells can evenly pass through the different layers. And of course you get a much bigger uh, separation. So the ability to this is based on the difference between the RCF min versus the RCF max. So on a fixed angle, you only have a small separation here. Not only do your platelets have to climb up this wall, but you got a small differential. Here you get a big differential, differentiation between RCF max and min, and these cells can free pass because the thing is completely horizontal, so they just walk back and forth. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen after spin cycles, the angle, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys will recognize this angle. That is caused by a fixed angle centrifuge. Okay? When you see these types of angles here, that's from fixed angle centrifugation. And again, what happens, all the cells are clumping up on the back and then they're trying to separate layers back there. It's not very effective. Much more effective to do it this way here on a horizontal centrifuge, okay? On a horizontal centrifuge, you get complete clean. So when I showed the videos earlier, of course, all those clots are produced on horizontal centrifuges, which means that when I pull that membrane out, I don't need to you know, cut on an angle or peel it on an angle. It's just flat and I just, Okay, cut it completely horizontally. Again, look at the difference, fixed angle, horizontal. Okay, so it's much easier to work with, of course, as well. Not only are you getting better layer separations, but it's easier to separate these as well. How many people have seen this, right? On your tube, you start seeing these little red dots at the back. What is that? That is all of these little red blood cells are literally smacking, right? Against the back walls. So this spin cycle starts, you're going at 700 G-force or 2,700 RPM at 700 G. Imagine a fighter jet when he's flying up in space at you know, Godzilla speeds, you wanna call it, this is three, four G-force. These centrifuges are spinning at 700 G and these cells, they literally get slammed back there. And so when you see this stuff here, these are actually cells that have gone through literally just smashing and they exploded and they just hang out back there. And when you look histologically at this stuff, you just see a whole bunch of cells in the back 
all smashed and clumped up at the back there. Okay, so our research team uh, has done some work with the international team from plantology, looking at the horizontal centrifuge as a new method to separate these layers uh, more effectively. And we're one of the first teams to do the research very, you know, scientifically. We've done 100 G for three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes, 200 G, same time points. And what we're trying to figure out now is how do the layers separate at the different protocols? And I can tell you, uh, big differences. For example, you can look at 100 G for 12 minutes and you look at this liquid and you look at 1000 G for three minutes, you look at these two things, they look identical. They're not identical, okay? What's in there in these layers, completely different. But you as a clinician, you might look at the little liquid, you say, oh, I made my little liquid pure app or, oh, I got a membrane, I got a clot. Well, that clot might have actually nothing in it, okay? Or it might be completely loaded in cells. And that's where, you know, the basic research needs to be done on the devices to make sure that what you're doing as a clinician is actually more beneficial for your patients. Okay, so now when we spin on the horizontal centrifuges, it's the first time where you've ever seen white blood cells now and the monocytes really in the upper layer, platelets in the upper layer, red blood cells in the bottom layer. Even to this day, you know, we still have about 15, 20% of the cells that are still not going to the upper layer. Okay, so there's still more work to be done, but of course, you know, when I compare this right here and I look at the LPRF or the interspin protocols, I mean, it's just night and day. I mean, I, I always shake my head at clinicians that still use this LPRF protocol. I, you know, they clearly have not read any of the literature over the last like, five or six years, right? People just get used to using devices, get used to pushing a button. And uh, it's a little bit sad because, of course, the patients can benefit a lot from uh, using better technologies. Okay? But, of course, you're still going to get better results with the LPRF than nothing. And that's just the horizontal technology. And of course, uh, you get four times more cells. So typically, you know, you get a lot more cells. Papers have been published. So anybody wants those, I'm more than happy to send them to you guys. Now, another thing with the tubes, so um, I'm going to turn the volume off. I'll just speak through it quickly. When we were actually testing uh, the tubes, we were trying to see how good these vacuums are. This right here is very, very, very important. And I want you, for those that use PureF, go back to your clinics and do this small little simple test. We test to see how powerful the vacuums are in the different tubes because you, you have 90 seconds to draw the blood. And unfortunately, some of the vacuums are going so slowly that it takes a lot more than 15 seconds. Well, as we were doing these experiments, okay, take a look at this. Some of you guys might've seen these APRF X tubes. Okay, these are the newer uh, APRF tubes. And uh, we're taking them out from brand new packages expiring in 2020. We start to fill these things up and look what we find. All these chemicals, all this uh, company declares it as being silicone, silicone in the tubes on the walls. Okay. Uh, amazing. Okay. And so we were obviously unhappy with that uh, as scientists when we saw this. These are not FDA cleared uh, as a class two medical device either. And uh, even the same company, take a look at this, APRF, this is from uh, earlier years when we were doing some research with this, 2017. The older tubes, you can see now they're individually wrapped instead of dual package. The glass looks different, the tubing is different, uh, and then we, we actually run the, the experiment, and look, just water, perfect, no chemical additives, okay? And so amazingly, and it's one of the reasons why People are unaware of some of these things. You know, I highly recommend that people do the testing of their tubes just to make sure what you're using is actually chemical free. A lot of people have reported now more inflammatory responses with uh, certain types of tubes. Again, these are, these are from 2020, expiring in 2020. And again, when we do the test, it's a very simple test. Like I said, instead of putting the butterfly needle in a, in a vein full of blood, you just put it in a bowl of water. And as the water fills up, look what you see. All the chemicals, the silicone. Basically, looks like soap and you're putting that back into a patient. So um, again, there's been a lot of reports, anyone using uh, Chaprune's PureF have experienced any increased risk for infection or increased pain versus non-PureF. Myself and another friend have experienced that with quite a few procedures, although similar procedures were considered to perform well without PureF, we were puzzled and want to, to know why. And so people started making discussions on social media, trying to figure out why. And then one group of colleagues out in Japan published this really interesting article Evidence for contamination of silica microparticles in advanced platelet-rich fiber matrix prepared using silica-coated plastic tubes. And what was happening was that whatever is being shed off these tube walls, 
are actually going inside the fibrin clots. And so they would make these PRF membranes with these, you know, non completely glass type tubes. So they either have coatings on the walls or it's plastic with, with different types of tubes. And this is going into your PRF membrane. So they take the PRF membranes out. They would basically uh, remove all the fibrin cloth with different enzymatic digestion. And what was left over, they would actually do SCM, so scanning electron microscopy. And this is what you see. And that is what's going back into your patient. Okay? So uh, amazing. Um, and amazingly, the company said one of the reasons why that was occurring was because the tubes had a vacuum. Okay? And it's definitely not because of the vacuum the tube. It's not like causing bubbles from the, the vacuum. So one very simple test that I had people start doing was just take your tube, fill it with halfway up with water, shake the tube, okay, and just make sure there's nothing in it. Okay, so again, if you do the same test with one of these uh, of the newer APRF tubes, you put a little bit of water in there, shake it up, okay, right away, you're going to see, even though the vacuum is gone, you get the bubbles, and that's just what's coming off the walls, okay. Right? It's the silicon coating, so quite important. Now, when we learned this a year ago, uh, we wanted to develop obviously tubes that were completely sterile and completely chemical free. Uh, all those red tubes there are all eight different types of tubes. They're all different. Here's the interspin tubes, okay? Uh, those are silica coated plastic tubes. And uh, what I would start doing is, and I just want to show this video because it's quite cool. Um, I drew my blood and here there's six different types of tubes here. So you can see there's intraspin tubes, there's APRF tubes, there's these new glass tubes that we developed that are chemical free. And uh, I drew two of each, so six tubes total. So if you look here, look, I got different types of tubes there. First one's the APRF, second intraspin, and then the glass one, then I draw them in a random order. So I had uh, somebody draw my blood, okay? And then we spun it in the BioPRF system there. And in the middle of the spin, while it's going for eight minutes, I just go over there and do the, the water test just to show people uh, what's going on with that. I wanna show people the difference. This is my own blood. Okay? And I highly recommend that if you use PRF, do this test, okay? Now look, there's the intraspin tubes, the glass tubes and the APRF tubes. I wanna show you guys how big of a difference this will, this will make. So here's the tubes that are coming out after the spin. This is an eight minute spin cycle, okay? These are the glass tubes that my team developed and they're very hydrophilic. So when you understand the biology, you got to make a really hydrophilic surface. That's totally glass, eight minutes without popping the lids. You can take the tube, you can put it immediately upside down. The whole thing's clotted, okay? We understand how these things clot and how to do with the surface, okay? And that's not because it's my blood, it's because of the tube, okay? And what I make a point of showing right after this is look, this tube's fully clotted. The other tubes have been sitting there now for you know a minute longer, okay? And look, completely upside down. That's not going anywhere. That's just based on the tube technology. Now look, this is the other tube. Look at that, it's still liquid. That's the interspin tube. Look at that, that whole upper portion is still liquid. Look at, I can't even do anything, okay? The clot is about half the size and there's chemical additives in that tube, okay? Very, very big difference. Here's the glass tube again that we developed again. That's the other sample, put it upside down. Look, okay, doesn't matter. Thoughts not going anywhere, okay? So very, very cool, and that's just based on tube technology. So if anybody wants to read more about that, and one thing that was funny actually is when I posted that video and people started getting our tubes, look what they started doing, okay? People just started posting everywhere on social media, you know, tubes upside down, etc. And literally, I can tell right away, look, when I look at tubes like this, I know right away that this person here spun on a fixed angle centrifuge because all the, the cells are banged up there, okay? I know that this person here spun on a horizontal one, right? It's a clean separation. You're gonna have better layer separation here. Look at how clear the yellow is here and look at how much more red it is here. You didn't get a better, you didn't get a very good separation, there, okay? And that's why, like I said, you need to understand what you're doing with this stuff, right? Uh, always buy highly researched products so it doesn't make a difference. And uh, I got some really nice comments here. I got to admit these tubes are a game changer, incredible results compared to the previous inferior tubes I was using. Thanks with Myron for the opportunity. Um, and for those that want these, you can get them at BioPRF. This is actually an educator uh, who teaches with the BioHorizons and the Interspin. And uh, he tried them. I said, look, Steve, just try these tubes. I sent him a couple free. And he sent me a message just saying what a huge difference it made. Uh, they could actually turn the tubes upside down. Way to go, Dr. Meyer. Um, so that's, you know, you can find these tubes if you want. Uh, 
some of these tubes are found on the biopuref.com webpage, and it's uh, what we've developed more recently. Now, last thing I want to explain just over these next five minutes is some of the work that we're doing with lasers um, and alpuref. So one thing that's cool, and we'll learn about this in the facial aesthetics course, is one of uh, my colleagues, Dr. Murau's, developed a technology where you actually take PRF and you heat it. And when you heat it, it actually denatures the proteins. And the proteins will then last, instead of two weeks, they last four to six months. Okay? So it's one way that you can use PRF. When everybody always makes the comment, you know, PRF has short resorption properties, we can't use it as a GBR membrane. This will literally last uh, literally four months. Okay, so it's a really cool way. And what we do now is we use these lure to lure lock connectors and we basically just mix different types of PRF with different things. So the way the protocol works is we take uh, PRF blood, we spin it, we separate the layers. The top play, the pore layer goes into the heater, goes in there for 10 minutes, we heat it up. And the buffy coat where all the cells are found, we take that and we mix it back in later. And then we get what's called the al PRF. And that's what it looks like. So it looks different but it's still injectable. It's an albumin gel, and then we can make these. And when we put these in these animal models, it literally lasts four months, okay? And it still stays there four months later. So unlike PRF, which will disappear when you inject it into somebody's lips, this stuff will last four to six months into somebody's lips, and it's 100% natural, okay? So the future, like I said, is really, really bright when it comes to some of these developments as well. Here's an animal injected on one side with PRF, this is uh, a about a month later, completely gone. Here's the Alpure, still hanging out there, okay? Complete bump. We can use this for, you know, one application is, for example, on top of uh, titanium meshes, uh, you know, make sure you get a nice thick layer, reduce the rate of exposure. Uh, really, really cool stuff that we're doing with this. Again, here's just the protocol described. So we spin fast, we take out the upper layer, we put it in the bioheat device, we heat it there, seven degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. Uh, we take the buffy coat layer, that's where all the cells are, and then we mix them back and forth. And you get what's called this albumin gel. Take a look at this video. Okay, this is me. Uh, I'm making it. This is what it looks like. So as it's being injected, you can tell it's definitely thicker than the liquid PRF that you used to. Take a look at the albumin. And you can create shapes. Okay, I can make a membrane, whatever shape that I want. I can inject this into somebody's lips. Right? I can put this in a deep fold, and this is totally natural. I can put this in, a, in an intraboni defect pocket. You know, very, very cool what I can do with it. Here it is there. Look at this. This is the Al PRF. This is only a couple minutes later. Look at, completely clotted, okay? And this will last four months. Now they have uh, bio PRF heat trays uh, where you can actually create custom shapes. So these are actually the same size of 30 by 40 membrane that you're typically used to buying from a company. You can make that now completely natural, okay? You make it for a few dollars, put it in there, use that as a barrier membrane. It will last four to six months. So lots of research ongoing there. And then of course with the laser, I'm not gonna go over too much about lasers. Of course, we've done a lot of work with photodynamic therapy and perio and perioimplantitis regeneration. Uh, this is Tony Schoolian, my, my supervisor's done a lot of work. Uh, Dr. Romanos, Frank Schwartz, uh, a couple of us have done Quite a lot of work. Like I said, you can look up Tony Schoolian and Frank Schwartz with lasers. They've done more than 20 articles. They've really contributed to the field quite significantly on this topic. And of course, nowadays it's used for many different procedures. Um, you can use the Erbium YAG in, in perimplantitis. Uh, you can use ND YAG as well for periodontal disease. I mean, there's different lasers, do different applications. When you look at the whole spectrum of lasers, of course, the one that's most uh, commonly utilized today, I would say, is the Fotona laser. And one of the reasons why is just because you get two uh, different types of lasers in one. So instead of buying two lasers, you get both an ND egg and also an Herb Yeg, uh, uh, Herb Yeg, uh laser. So here's just, you know, cleaning out a periodontal pocket. Now, I want to show you guys what we're doing today. After these pockets are cleaned, which is typical standard, what the company will teach you, what do we do today? What do you think we do? We take PRF and we put them in those pockets, right? So we cut these up. We make these tiny little uh, PRF membranes. And again, where do you take the membrane? You take it always from the bottom. Why do you take it from the bottom? Because as the thing's spinning, the more cells are at the bottom, okay? And then all we do is we basically enter in the PRF clot inside the pockets, okay? Don't need to do, don't need to raise flaps. And typically studies have now shown, there's one coming out in Journal of Clinical Perio, wasn't done by my group, another group. Uh, they've actually shown that, um, 
you can get two, three more millimeters uh, by doing this. So no, we, we will play sutures sometimes, but again, some colleagues will not place any sutures at all. Just like a prop form and uh, away you go. So the very, very cool uh, kind of future uses of, of the laser. Another thing more recently that we're doing, I'm sure a lot of people know about Arrestin, for example, or Perio chips, you know, the Perio chip, for instance, these things are somewhat good in the sense that you get antibiotics or you get chlorhexidine and that's going to fight infection. But the bad thing about this is that, of course, you're getting a polymer, which is your carrier system. And of course, polymers are terrible for inflammatory cells, right? So you already have an inflammatory issue in a periodontal pocket, and then you introduce a polymer in there, which is going to make your inflammatory cells go even crazier. And it's always a trade-off because you get the good antibiotics, but you get the bad where your inflammatory cells are going to get happy with polymer carrier systems. What do we do today? We use that same lure lock connector. One side, we got liquid pure F. The other side, we put either the antibiotic or the chlorhexidine in the exact same concentration as a perio chip, so 2.5 milligrams. We just mix it up. Then we have our carrier system, which is liquid pure F. And then we put that in the pocket, okay? And that is very, very cheap and very, very effective. So again, we take the liquid pure F, we draw it up, we mix it with the antibiotic, okay, very quickly. Okay, these little lure lock connectors, about a dollar each. And then with this much liquid, you can literally do a full arch, okay? Very, very cool what you can do uh, there. For those that wanna learn more about lasers, I highly recommend uh, Dr. Schiffman, Harvey Schiffman teaches down in uh, Boynton uh, Beach. Great, great, great course with respect to lasers. Like I said, I took his program, uh, fantastic guy. His whole practice is geared and dedicated to lasers. So he's a great colleague to learn from. He's based out of Florida and uh, he's done a lot of cases. He's written a nice book chapter as well on, on using lasers with PRF uh, and facial aesthetics as well, but he uses it across the board in dental applications as well. Uh, for those that want to learn more about biomaterials, uh, my book was written by quintessence every year, once or twice per year, I head up there and I teach a biomaterial course where we teach literally two days you know, how to use these new biomaterials, how to learn these new technologies, adapt them in your practices. And uh, I don't accept any company money at all. When I do lectures, I, I never accept any money from any of the companies. What I do instead is I ask each of the companies to donate uh, biomaterials to the participants. So every person that takes the course will get a free bone scraper, uh, different types of new allografts, xenografts that I recommend, uh, membranes, they get the free tubes that I've just showed you today, the ones that work well, uh, get some endogain and get some vitamin D, the Dentomedica. So if you take one of these courses, you can learn more about it on our website, completely uh, nice package. Actually, the course, I think every year they run it for $14.95 and you get more than $1,500 worth of free biomaterials in the course. So it's a fun one to take and I enjoy teaching that one. Um, most recently, I had the opportunity to uh, help um, Michael Picos write uh, probably one of the best books I've ever read in my life on uh, bone augmentation. He's based out of Florida as well. I, I just wrote a small section on biomaterials, but everything in the book is entirely his. Uh, it's got some great, great, great uh, recommendations for sinus grafting, GBR and extraction site management with implants. Uh, highly recommended for you guys to take a look at that. You can find it at uh, the picosinstitute.com. Um, this is my email right here. So if anybody wants any of the references that I've discussed or has any questions right now, more than happy to answer them. I'm sorry I've gone a little bit over my time schedule here. I uh, had a lot of info there and I'm sure uh, there's, there's a few questions now. I think it was great. We've got some questions here, Rick. So thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation. So I'm going to go from the beginning. So this is going to go back a little bit, but um, the question is, what is the duration of the effect of applied PRF? Now, this had to do originally when you're talking about the regeneration. So we're talking about in the first uh, half hour of the presentation. Yep. Uh, so typically you get growth factor release for about 14 days. Okay. Uh, that's the older technology. Today we've done, of course, the similar studies with the al where we heat the proteins and then remix back in the cells. And in that technology there, it will last typically, you know, upwards of two months but you don't have as much early growth factor release. You get it more kind of slowly and gradually as the albumin is being broken down. All right, good, thank you. Next one is, I will buy your textbooks soon, but with a socket graft with all walls intact, can it be used over the occlusal, not as a membrane, but as a plug 
without a DPTFE membrane or without a collagen sure, plug itself? Absolutely. It can. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, then absolutely. what's what yeah, sutures would be best with this? Um, would you use periacrylic glue? No, I wouldn't use any of the glue. We use sutures definitely. Um, again, I'm you know I'm a biomaterial guy, and when I see what some of these different types of biomaterials will do, especially chemical based, I don't like them at all because they do cause inflammation. The only one that I like a lot is tetronite, of course, which is the bone adhesive that I showed, and only because those proteins are found naturally occurring. So those are actual, you know, naturally occurring proteins that are found in animals, uh, and they they won't cause as much inflammation as some of these polymers or chemicals. Uh, for sutures, like I said, many people will use different types of sutures. I don't think it really makes a huge, huge difference, uh, whether it be glycolon is one that we, we typically will use, but, uh, at the university, they'll use Vicro, different things. And then, uh, I'm not an expert in that field. Let's put it that way there. My expertise is in biomaterials. Okay. Uh, well, let's, uh, well, uh, and of course this is a biomaterial, but, um, it's an adjunct. If we're talking about a PTFE membrane, do you have a feeling as to whether it's going to provide anything in addition as a an epithelial excluder or as a socket former or something along that line? Uh, so the real question with PRF is whether or not for extraction sockets, it's worth it for a single case. Okay. So for example, you know, already your allograph and extraction site is going to work very well with a PTFE membrane. That's kind of a standard. Uh, when I was working with Dr. Picos, uh, both in his courses as well as in his books, you know, you see the case after case after case that just turned out beautifully, you know, and you ask him, why not use PRF in those cases? Like, do I really need to? That's not, you know, those are predictable. It's really in the cases like, let's make this big GBR procedure. Let's give it a little bit more vascularization in these cases. Let's improve the handling of the graft, right? Let's, if we have a big sinus case, then we'll use it in 100% of cases in the sinuses. But for simple extractions like that, well, we use PRF, you know, maybe 20, 30% of the time. It's not something that I would do uh, routinely or recommend. And I'm not a big fan in using it alone without a bone graft. So I've seen people do that where they pack them in the sockets, use it alone. Uh, I've seen the studies, you know, uh, they look good. It definitely implants can be placed, there's no question. But you get a little bit more dimensional uh, change when compared to using a bone graft material. And uh, I always try and recommend people practice dentistry based on the highest possible standard. So whatever's best, that's what I'm uh, typically going for. And uh, so, yeah, that's just, that's just my personal philosophy. Now, a lot of people will have holistic practices that will not use allografts or xenografts. And then, you know, you see these guys do a lot of these cases. Well, hey, compared to a blood clot, this is going to definitely perform better. And so I have no, no problem with people that practice differently or don't make uh, judgment calls on recommendations that way there. I just test the biomaterials and, and we look at the randomized studies and find out what's working best and give recommendations thereafter. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there any value in adding EMD to the plug for the grafting? So that's adding, adding EMD to a PRF. Uh, it's a good question. You know, for perio, I'm not too sure. Um, it's a very good question. It's never been studied. Biologically speaking, it makes sense because enamel matrix proteins are meant to be applied to root surfaces basically only, and that helps with, you know, reattachment, uh, and then use PRF thereafter. But nobody has ever done a study and there's only been one comparative study in, uh, intrabony defects, you know, PRF versus endogain. It's not, not very well studied. So, uh, I think... I think biologically it makes sense, but you know, we need more data, of course, to be able to make any type of recommendations there. But uh, if that person wants to join my lab and do that clinical study, I'm more than happy to accept them. <laughs> We're always hiring PhD students for 21,000 a year. So you let me know. I'll tell you, I know he's not doing very much right now. He may be inclined. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'll tell him if he's not, if he's not listening right now. All right. Final question um, is, with regard to the vitamin D test. Um, which test do you, you mm -hmm. use to determine vitamin D blood level? Are you using the vitamin D25 or using the vitamin D125? And I don't know about the vitamin D125, uh, so that's a new one for me. We The one that's tested is uh, vitamin D3 on the little uh, scanner test. So that's very, very commonly provided in, in Europe and just recently came to North America about a year, year and a half ago. And that's the blood test that we typically do. 
it's uh, literally less than, I think it's $19 per test. So it's not very expensive and you can do it right in your lab. So they have, you know, all the lab work done and we've compared it to standard blood tests as well. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in, in the vitamin D testing as well. I just say, what is a standard vitamin D3 test? They go get it done. And then I compare it to the results just to make sure that the little device is working. And then when I see that it's working pretty accurately, it's basically like a, a filter, right? If I have somebody that's, uh, you know, 46 and on a blood test, they would be 48 or 50. I don't really care. It's whenever I'm screening and I find somebody that's at 16, that's when I pull the plug and I'm saying, oh, I'm about to place six implants. Let's, uh, let's pull back on this. We got 11% failure rate. I'm not going to take this risk. We're going to do this in four weeks after you've been supplemented with the Denimedica. Yeah, very good. Those are all the questions. Uh, Rick, uh, as always, uh, fantastic pre um, preparation and fantastic, fantastic um, presentation. Uh, Mike Picos is a member of our organization, by the way. Um, and uh, he sends his oh, best. So right. I let him know you're going to be on tonight. And he unfortunately has something else. Oh, good. I didn't know. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, contact Rick. Rick is totally accessible, and you may be Rick. You may be sorry I just said that, but uh, he is dedicated to research and actually increasing our abilities to apply that real uh, research that he's doing to to our to our practices. So uh, um, Rick could be doing a lot of things. He's dedicated himself to research, and and uh, and that's pretty neat. We all benefit from that. So Rick. Not, not only for the presentation, but thanks for dedicating yourself to, to, to the very best. Thank you. So uh, that's it for this, for this session, uh, of, this, uh, of this IDS session. Uh, anybody who's interested in more, learning about, more about the IDS, just write to me, Lee, director of dentistry.com, which is how you got onto this to begin with. Um, and for uh, those of you who are ready for the next presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, perio and ortho uh, research that uh, has been done by Dr. David Matthews, uh, periodontist out in Seattle. That'll happen in December. You'll get plenty of advanced notification uh, for that and uh, for all of you. Um, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, Rick, thanks again. We'll see you again real soon. Thank you.